to another episode of open bar it's lovely to see you all again yeah Apart from you dave no. oh it was I worth we were... like well statistically there's like what two thousand people watching right now that's uh there's got to be at least one dave in the audience I right now we so I'm talk about him anymore head. after everything he did you know <laughs> move on from dave yeah. they've ruined everything we're, man this is a dave free zone now i'm sorry <laughs> don't mean to single mm. you out but we had to well, yeah, that's uh, that's what we're all about. Uh, victimization. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but anyway, welcome everyone. This is uh, Open Bar number 63, and it's a pleasure to have you all. And uh, well, we've got a great lineup of guests this evening, so I reckon we, do we should start bringing them in. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, making his official debut on the Open Bar, because he just kind of gate crashed it last time, and I didn't really have a chance to introduce him or anything, but this is his first proper guest spot. It is the one and only Shad Brooks. Shadiversity, in fact. Welcome aboard, my friend. It's great to have you here, finally. I'm sorry, where am I? I was just walking around UK and I stumbled into this thing and I'm um, just... There's, all, there's drunk people everywhere. Everywhere <laughs> I go, there, there's drunk people. I don't know where I am or what's going on and the roads are terrible and there's lots of stairs and uh, other than that, I'm going great. How are you guys? If the people are, are sleeping great. on the floor, just leave them be. You don't need to do yeah. anything about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, uh, yeah. In the bar, they've, they've had themselves a drink and, you know, that's fine. <laughs> I do agree with you, though. The roads are fucking terrible here. That's just uh, that's part of living in the UK, I'm afraid. <laughs> like, holy crap. I was not prepared for how... Like, look, narrow, I get. You guys have traffic lights on your roundabouts. And like, yeah. I, I, what you, I, and then when you go on a roundabout, you, you don't know which lane you need to get in to get onto the... Because there are certain lanes that I don't care. Like, the roads, they don't give a stuff. If you're in this lane, you are getting off this roundabout. Screw you. And you're like, I, did, I didn't want to get off here, but I'm stuck in this freaking lane. And then you're gone. And so anyway, all right. That, that's been a nightmare. But other than that, the countryside is absolutely amazing. The, the history is phenomenal. And guys, I can confirm... Your bacon is better. <gasps> yes, like, like, you yes. heard it here, everyone. Yeah, like, that, that is surrender. The British I, I know, I know. Best. I like if there is any compliment that I could give Britain, that's probably one of the highest compliments right friggin' there. Mm -hmm. We win. Are you are you a smoked or an unsmoked man when it comes to bacon, Chad? I need to know. I, I'm not even that smoked. refined drinker. I'm just like, <laughs> give me bacon and then I eat it. And it's like, well, this is good. This is like, you know, I, I cook it. I, I throw it in the frying pan and I cook it and I eat bacon. No, it's really solid. Point. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Good way to live. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I think so. Uh, no, there's there's one like awesome thing about the roads here that I love. It's uh, you know when you start getting potholes everywhere. It's like a, a sensible man, like say this this whole stretch of road just needs to be redone. We're just going to take it up and uh, we'll relay it. But nah, over here we just like to patch up little tiny bits here and there and everywhere. And so eventually you just get this horrible patchwork quilt of a road that like it's all <laughs> over the place. Uh, it's it's very special and it's very unique to Britain. <laughs> Love it. I mean, it could get really pretty. Like you have these gorgeous big hedges right on either side. You can't really see anything past them, and then they kind of overgrow the road, and you're know, like going through tunnels of trees, and it's absolutely gorgeous it's beautiful until you actually come to an oncoming car and then you're like holy crap there's not enough room where do i go uh so you ever <laughs> been on a road where it could be so far away from civilization that it's like a big long narrow thing and it it goes to like 90 degrees suddenly in a forest and so you have to stop honk your horn you're basically like, is anyone around that corner <laughs> like yeah. i wouldn't want to hit you and the i other don't know what like, i'm going I'm into here. But also, like, all right, here's another thing, right? I'd never understood, uh, like, the British hatred of cyclists 
until now. I actually get it because yeah. in Australia, there's a cyclist. There's, there's heaps of room on the side of the road and you just pass it. You never really have too much pr- trouble with cyclists because we've got so much freaking room where they just ride on the uh, on the sidewalk. Here, when you come across a cyclist, it backs up traffic. You legitimately, like, like they're in your way. You stop and 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 then trying to pass them. If if if, if it's a busy road, you're, you're having to go into oncoming traffic and everything. They're, they, they're they a nightmare. Take a kind of- they take a kind of perverse pleasure in the fact that they're holding you up as well. Uh, and <laughs> thing is, no matter how many I've run over, there's always more. That's the problem. <laughs> like they just keep multiplying, and like I'm doing my best, but like, come on, people of Britain, you need to help me out on this one. Jeez, we have, we have to pull together here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, it's a real pleasure to have you on the the open bar, man. Uh, this is what happens when you come over to the UK. We actually are on the same time zone. I so know we'll get you that's in. great. That's I can't, yeah. Well. Pleasure to be here, guys. I've been really looking forward to it, and thanks for having me. Nice one, mate. Uh, all right, we should bring the rest of our guests in. Uh, making his return to the open bar, it's the... the Well, is it Man- Manchester or Liverpool he's from? He can clue us in. Uh, either way, he, he delivers some of the most scathing rants uh, about modern movies and TV shows that puts me to shame. Uh, he is Reaper. Welcome, welcome aboard, my friend. All right, thanks for having me back. And it's Liverpool. I thought, yeah, okay, yeah. I don't, that's that's probably a deadly insult that I compared you to Manchester. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be. Yeah. I've already broke my phone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but no, thanks for thanks for coming back on, man. And uh, yeah, your coverage of Ahsoka has been fantastic so far. I've really enjoyed your videos. Oh, thanks. It's well, it's given me plenty of material to just criticize because it's just ah, uh, it's so bad. Why oh yeah, we'll like get it? into that okay. in a minute. Jeez. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for coming on. And uh, last up, this is making his uh, his debut on the open the open bar. Um, he's a good friend of Sargon. Um, I've been lucky enough to go on a live stream with him talking about uh, historical war movies. Uh, but he's coming here to give his thoughts on on Ahsoka and various other things. It is the history, bro. Welcome aboard. And you look very intelligent there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Drinker. Really appreciate it. Um, it's been a a little while since I last spoke to you, and uh, I'll be representing sort of London or the southeast here. So, uh, yeah, no, it's great to speak to you. Last time I spoke to you was a, maybe a year or two ago now. I feared that uh, it's been an a article, while, yeah. yeah, I did fear that an article I wrote on Lotus Eaters absolutely caning Scotland, well, the SNP, uh, might have uh, put me out of favour with you, but I don't think it's anything of the sort. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, no, again, thanks, I mean, I, I pay up approximately zero seconds per day uh, attention to politics, so it's yeah. fine. <laughs> I love your background as well. Like, you're, it's a very uh, an intellectual setting for this. Thank you. Are they even uh, real books? Who knows? Yeah, it's a green they screen. Are, in damn fact, it! All real books. It's all <laughs> real background. See, I, I want one of those chairs. Those chairs are just absolutely awesome. It does look really comfortable. Oh, great. They were really like thinking it was the volume screen in the background. Exactly. That's what you, you, you need, a brandy. So, and then, then you start reviewing things and you're a man of culture and it's mm-hmm. very fitting. Yeah. Um, yeah, it must be an interesting experience as an Aussie, like coming to a place that has culture and history. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Well, we have culture. It's just hey, you guys, you guys take the piss out of us all the time. I okay, know, I know. This is my one opportunity to get one over. <laughs> well, well, that's well. I mean, the interesting thing is, though. I mean, as soon as you go back past two hundred years, uh, like that's the length of Australia's settled colonial history. Anything further back, my history is literally here. I'm like all my ancestors: English, Irish, Scottish, and Welsh. That's them all. And so, I am a product of Britain, you could say, mm. uh, on multiple levels. And I reckon. Uh, you know, us Aussies, we're basically just kind of secondhand British people. You know, so, uh, uh, you know, America and Australia are kids, and then they're all grown up, so cute. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're, making they're, their own decision. Well, yeah, we can we can sit back with our arms folded and be like, ah, how are the, hey, how are the kids getting on without us? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's up, <laughs> Rico? At times. I was just I was just gonna say, do you want to know the history of my city? It was I the center it. of the. It was the center of the British slave trade and it made all its money from it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> ah, legacy to be There's proud some of. real culture. If you if you want to come to Liverpool, then yeah, you could see all the docks and all the boats and everything that they went on. Didn't they um a few years ago, like during the the, the mostly peaceful protest, didn't they throw a statue into the river there? Because it was like, yeah, one of the guys who'd uh, a few like, places, yeah, because it's a very left sorry. 
yeah like he he'd uh like he'd obviously made money in the the trade and um you know funneled those profits into like improving the city of liverpool so he got a statue and stuff like commemorating him and then they were like nah it's time to time to take this down so they just ripped it out of his base and threw it into the river well most of the city's like far left wing I'm like, I'm like the only person who's not even left and just like I'm miles away from everyone else Everyone's like I'm surprised. Communist. I'm surprised. Shad claims to be of British stock because I always thought he was a bloody abo myself. <laughs> what? Oh, oh, what gave it away? Was it my skin color? <laughs> <laughs> oh, people have pointed out as well in chat. It was at, it was Bristol apparently that that happened. So yeah, um, I apologize. I was wrong. Uh, I guess wow. they had their own share of that stuff as well. Yeah, we never had a statue. <laughs> we just did Fair evil enough. stuff and it never yeah. got rewarded. We just quietly <laughs> like smiled at each other and like, oh yeah, we did it. See, we Australia did. Of culture. We need more statues. Australia needs more statues and definitely more castles. Um, we, you know, like I said, you go past three hundred years, we got caves. And that's that's the, yeah, Ooh, and that's the caves. thing. Like castles were kind of out of fashion by the time you guys got to Australia. I, it's already. tragic. I've been, I've yeah. been, I've been just going nuts seeing all the castles. They are absolutely amazing. Well, you got to defeat uh, all your local wildlife first, so you can make room. We're still at war. That's why I'm trying to bring them back into fashion. Uh, mm -hmm. I think castles would be an excellent addition to the, uh, you know, eradication of the emu menace. Because uh, you must have been surprised when people over in Britain were like, "Oh no, a spider!" And Shad would be like, "Ah!" And they'd be like, "No, no, no, no." It's well, well it funny thing. Do anything. I, like, like I wasn't expecting to come across spiders in Britain because they're they're not you know you're not very well known for your spiders in Australia we are. Um, but when I was staying at uh, Warwick Castle, actually, a spider actually crawled out from under the bed, and I and I was like, "Well, there you go." I wasn't expecting to see you, and then I just squished it with my hand. You know, that's how we, we have them. we have plenty of spiders. They're all just shit ones, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, I, like I'm sorry, guys. I wasn't very impressed. I mean, this was supposed to be one of your biggest, and it was about the size of an Australian. Australian fifty cent coin, and so yeah, we get say, like, Australian spiders would probably eat our spiders for breakfast. <laughs> yes. Not even like bat an step eyelash, on them, yeah. probably. Like I could, I could picture it's like here he comes, the big British spider shad just like flattens it with a sword. <laughs> it's like, oh, is he dead already? Okay, well that's that's fine. <laughs> that that's kind of was the experience. I was like. I, you know, it was a good effort, you know. Well, good try, good try. If anything, there Probably are allies it's... over here. They kind of mop up a lot of the other insects, you know? Exactly. Yeah, flies and stuff. But, like, you know, like, for once in your life, you can let your guard down because not everything here is trying to kill you. Yeah. Well, I, that has been my experience. Um, and so I, I have felt a little vulnerable because I haven't had a sword. But don't worry, I've already bought two. So I'm, I'm covered on that front now. <laughs> Yeah, the airlines tend to be a bit, they frown on swords on planes. <laughs> it's weird that way. <laughs> I've tried so many times. Just imagine trying to hijack a plane with a sword. <laughs> Got you now. Yeah. I feel like you should get a round of applause just for the sheer balls of trying it, you know. <laughs> like, wow, that guy really went for it. <laughs> uh, but hey, well, it's time to get down to business, gentlemen. And this, this business, I guess, should begin with Ahsoka. The show that we all know and love. Um, first up, I, I guess we can give our thoughts in a minute on episode three, because um, it just came out a couple of days ago. But uh, news about how well the show has been received. Um, Samba TV, which, uh, you know, most of the time streaming networks like Disney and uh, Netflix, they're pretty... Um, they're, they're pretty coy about their streaming numbers, but Samba TV just says, oh, what the hell? We'll just tell everyone exactly what people are watching. Um, and they they give you their figures. Now, it's not the complete numbers, but like generally the, the rule of thumb with them apparently is um, take whatever they give you and multiply it by three, and that's the total number of viewers. Now, what they said is that Disney's live uh, five day viewership for the first episode of Ahsoka drew in 1.2 million views. Now, that's interesting because it's on par roughly with um Andor and it's less than um, The Mandalorian season three, I believe. So it doesn't look good from a viewership perspective. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty bad numbers. It and is. This is this is a heavily advertised show as well. They they yeah. really wanted this to work. So when, when comparing it to Andor, were those Andor figures also from the same source? Yes. Yes. So oh, they, they can yeah. compare like for like, mm. basically. Yeah. Uh, and so, 
yeah, it, obviously, like you say, it's not it's not the complete well, picture, but like their general like their viewership numbers haven't changed a huge amount in that time. So it's a pretty accurate measure of how popular a show is. Star Wars is dead. A little bit of inference, right? Because Andor was once upon a time set to have a lot going on for it, as far as I knew, possibly as much as a, a several seasons spanning all kinds of shit doesn't anymore why well probably because season one did not perform the way disney wanted and now we also have to work with that it's uh around similar to how ahsoka's performing which for all we know cost them even more marketing than uh and or did and so it's like you have to you have to rely on facts like these and, and inferences from what decisions disney make as opposed to what they publicly announce because they're never going to announce when a funny show's coming out we're very happy to announce our show's doing really bad nobody's really watching it uh <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> it's like no, they're always going to say, "Oh, it's going great!" Oh, I even had a look at the Star Wars subreddit because I was uh, curious, and there's several posts being like, "Ahsoka is like breaking records for viewership. People are loving it, hyper engaged." I was like, "Where do they get that from?" And it's just like you know, fudging numbers is the is the term a lot of people come up with. But you've also got like a lot of people just nobody's talking about this show or what's happening in it because there's nothing to say. Most people are talking about the um the Sabine stab or. I mean, there's something that happens in episode three. We'll get to it. I assure surely, you. Surely it's the case that fault. Disney and uh, Lucasfilm have sort of alienated their core audience years ago, though, right? I mean, the people that really care about Star Wars are mainly blokes uh, of 40 and older who, you know, it's a big part of their childhood memories and their identity and all that sort of thing. All those guys are alienated years ago, right? I, I think yeah. so, yeah. Um well, I mean, they made it pretty clear based on how they, they structured their movies and their shows, like, that's the kind of fans they didn't want anymore. They wanted the new breed of fans who were going to embrace um, all these great new characters that they'd invented, uh, and no one really did. The, the problem is they didn't attract a new audience, but they kind of alienated their, their old audience, uh, and they're left with not a huge amount now. Like, who really is a oh, show yeah, aimed at, really, do you think? What what demographic of people? Well, it's, all it's, women. it's aimed at Dave Filoni, basically. Right, yeah. It's Dave like, Filoni's family. <laughs> it's aimed at the, 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 the 20 or 30 people who watched all of the Clone Wars and all of uh, Rebels uh, and, and still care enough about Star Wars that they would tune in for a show like this. That's, that's who it's aimed at, and that's why it's getting such low viewership figures, because uh, it doesn't do enough world building and enough um, setup that you you could really just dive right into it and understand what's going on and what these characters actually mean. Uh, and so people are put off by it. it I think me? it assumes that like p that these characters are much more popular than they actually are. Is it me or does like the whole universe not seem cool anymore? Like when I was a it kid, really doesn't. When I was a kid, in a little kid in the 80s and a teenager in the 90s, it was kind of cool, or in a really geeky way, it was cool to sort of know about the Star Wars uni universe, obscure things. And now it doesn't seem like anyone cares about it at all anymore. Is it, or is that, again, is that just me? No, I think you're right. Well, the magic's and, gone. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's also the writing quality. Like, if, you know, if this actually had something truly enjoyable that captured people's attention then i would be doing vastly better uh than what it is but i think about the episodes that we've seen and they've just been mostly boring and yeah they've tried with some action here and there but uh, uh, to me a good example is the introduction is the character's name sabine the purple haired one yeah right no, uh, they were they, yeah, yeah. They were so desperate for everyone to know how awesome she is. And so her intro is like, she's on a, a speeder and they got the rock music going and she doesn't care about authority. And, uh, and then she's going to, you know, so they're going to try and stop her. And she's, then she slides underneath it on a, on a speeder bike and everything like that. And it just came off as really try hard and cringe. Mm, and I'm wondering yeah. like, like, all right, what's a, re a character introduction that still had that badass quality but was far more endearing? And oddly enough, the one that came to my mind is uh, the one from Castlevania where uh, I forget his name. It's the Belmont. He's the main character, right? And Simon. He's, Trevor. Yeah, he's 
Is it Trevor? Like it's, it, I'm thinking of his introduction. It's Trevor's the first drunk one, yeah. in the bar. Yeah. Where they're happy to give him flaws and he, and he's a drunk and he's like, you know, and, and then he starts getting beaten on and he just has these funny quirky lines where he's like, please stop kicking me in the testicles. And then he finally fights back and is a badass. And, and he, it, it, it conveys heaps of character. It shows that he has his flaws and you're vastly more invested. It's, it, it goes into the same problem that we see so much with modern media is that these female characters, well, if we give them flaws, we might be saying that women are not strong and women must be strong. That's the message that we have to beat everyone over the head with. And so they just make them basically Mary Sue's. Not as big as perhaps what we've seen in other properties, but I really got those same vibes. And and look, I'm glad that, you know, Sabine isn't perfect. She flaw she has flaws in episode three, but I'm thinking of this introduction specifically. And it just, like I said, it felt really try hard and not I, much I character. I think as well with uh, with Sabine, like what the mold that they're trying to fit her into is the the maverick loose cannon who sort of plays by her own rules and she's like um, very unpredictable. She's kind of emotional. She's not like into following the rules, which is fine. Okay, it's a pretty basic character archetype, but you can run with it. Um, but they've paired it up with an absolute, complete, and total lack of any emotion uh, and and no reaction to anything. It's like they they had one and only character trait for her was stoic just like mm -hmm. with uh with ahsoka and just like with uh hera uh, and so like she's meant to be this this crazy maverick um character but she doesn't have any emotional reactions to anything she doesn't convey that that personality that you would expect with a character like that because she doesn't have a personality and so the two things don't really match up you're you're trying to tell us one thing about the character but everything she does all her reactions uh, say something completely different like some of it might just be that the actress is fucking terrible because that's definitely a possibility but i i think a lot of it is like that's how they wanted to portray her and i think it goes back to what you were saying shad with uh this being a female-centric show i think they didn't want to fall into the trope of it all being about emotions and uh you know everyone's you know shouting and uh and screaming at each other uh, but they went so far in the opposite direction. It's it's like a bunch of androids talking like, to like, each other. And the funny thing about that, though, right? If this show, okay, like if it full of female characters, I, I don't have a problem with that. I actually think, I, you know, it could be really fun. And I actually like imagine if they just lent into all the big stereotypes where that all these girls are trying to work together, but they they're just catty and they're getting annoyed with each other and they're fighting over the guy that they like and everything like that. And already you would have a vastly more entertaining show than what we have at the moment. Like. Yeah, it seemed to me from what I've seen is that there's very little acting going on. Actually, yeah. like it's almost like the director said, <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't want any expressions. I don't want you to use your face muscles at all. Like, you, you I, know, I, maybe Rosario Dawson, like narrow your eyes sometimes. That's all I want out of you. Other than that, just be expressionless. Maybe, with with Rosario Dawson. Well, maybe she had some Botox. <laughs> That's possible. Yeah. With with her in episode yeah. three, particularly, I have never seen an actor look so fucking bored out of their mind as she was. Like that's that's going beyond just acting stoic, and I think she just genuinely is like, okay, what is this character? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even know what I'm supposed to be right now. I'm just going to yeah. say my lines, collect my paycheck, and go home. And because... on this note, like I think one of the biggest nails in the coffins to prove your point here about the, that these characters have so little emotion. And at first, I was thinking, all right, it might have been a mistake. It was in episode two, but then we saw it again in episode three, and it's basically. Like when they're getting attacked in the in these space battles and everything like that, no one's worried at all. They're just bored. No. They're actually yeah. your life is at risk. <laughs> you're getting attacked, and you're sitting around like nothing is happening. We saw, you know, the Twi'lek when she's trying to chase it. There's like a big cannon blasting at her constantly, and she's like, "Oh yeah, let's uh, try and get a tracker. Can you throw a tracker? Come on, hurry up, get that tracker on." And and then in this th episode three, Ahsoka and Sabine they're in the ship. They're getting attacked, and they're not even. Stuff they like, oh, whatever. <laughs> it's just yeah, it's like, that, well, it's hard to just roll the ship to the left so that I can get a line of sight on these guys. Okay, I'll do that. It's like, just yeah, they're so fucking bored. The thing that <laughs> killed like, it for me in that well, scene was they were organizing it, like you just said, drinker, and then there's going to be a moment where she's going to call it in, right? And then they can sync up their moves. And so typically, a character's going to say, now, like that, that sort of thing. But uh, Ahsoka went, now. 
Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> that hit. And, I, like, because think of like they're obviously the point of comparison here would be in um, a new hope, like the the fight against the Tie Fighters on the Millennium Falcon when Luke's on the the guns, and that that scene is really exciting and fun because like um, you you feel the tension of the 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 chase. Um, they seem to be taking damage as they go. There's a real urgency to it, and when Luke scores a hit, he's like, oh, super excited. And then you get, you know, Han Solo being like, don't get cocky, kid. It's it's all great. It's like great, great character moments, you know, good action. It feels like there, there's stuff going on here that means something. With this, it's like, yeah, I, but those, I know exactly where this is leading. But there's so many contrivances as well, because when she's shooting at them with the cannon, it just goes, oh, we lost them. You go, what do you mean they lost them? They're literally in the ring. <laughs> yeah. And it's not just that. The, just lasers, the lasers don't work. <laughs> They literally, no one says she's not emotional. She's not emotional at all because they're getting shot at tons of times, and it doesn't even the ship doesn't even shake. Yeah, yeah. It's just, what what it's is the point of those yeah. those fighters? Like they do nothing. Well, they finally had a line like really late into the action series. Like, oh, deflectors are at ten percent. I was like, good god, these are the yes! best deflectors in humanity. <laughs> like, what the but fuck? but also, well, when they said that, I was like. Wouldn't you be a bit more worried? Like, what were you doing up to this point? I would be like, I would have been getting worried when they got to fifty percent, and then suddenly yeah, like, we only 10%. have ten percent left. I'm like, what the hell happened? Oh, holy crap! You guys are because I'm thinking if the shields go down, you'd be dead. One good solid blaster bolt, and and it's gone. And I nearly flipped out because when Ahsoka is on the, uh, she gets. Uh, so I don't, you know, spoilers. We're getting into the episode already, but there's a part where. That the people shoot at Ahsoka's ship while the shields are down, blasters actually hit the ship and they do nothing. They don't even scratch the ship and there's no shields on it. I'm like, yeah. what, is, what is going on? I, I had so many questions about that scene because like getting onto the hull of a ship while the shields are theoretically up, wouldn't that just like cut you in half or something when you try to get on it? But also <laughs> Just for the people who are watching this who might not have seen this episode, imagine that like you're getting under attack by like multiple um, starfighters and uh, they've crippled your ship with, with turbo laser blasts, right? And you're drifting. And they're swinging around to finish you off, right? In that space of time, like a few seconds while they're, they're closing in to finish you, um, Ahsoka has time to leave the, the cockpit, make her way down to the, the airlock, get into a spacesuit... <laughs> <laughs> it's got yeah. it's got stupid bits to cover her tentacle things. Even like, with their tentacles. It's so retarded. She's, how'd she stiff her tentacles into, into the thing? Yeah. Yeah. It's like and put all that shit on and then go on. Sabine, can you sit before... me up? <laughs> yeah. I just love to see a scene where she's trying to get the tentacles in and they won't fit properly, or they, they like it's like trying yeah. to put a glove on and your fingers don't line up properly. Ah, come on. Um and yeah, she does all that in the few seconds that it takes for these starfighters to to um circle around and come at them. And then I, I... she comes out onto the, the hull of the ship with a pair of lightsabers. I mean, it would be like me taking on an F-22 um uh, with a club. And just being like, come on, you motherfuckers. And then it you works. Know, it, <laughs> like, these things could just hover. Like, they don't have to close in on you because they're not aircraft. Um, they yep. could just stop, like, half a mile away and just blast away at you and, and kill you. And you've got nothing. Well, then, then you the... should deflect all the lasers back into them. Oh, on the oh, point. Just keep the, firing uh... until she gets tired. Like, just yeah. fire at parts of the ship she's not even on at that point. Just be like, what the fuck what is What Shad said doing? earlier about the, the deadpan delivery of the lot of the lines... Uh, again, can you only imagine what it's like on set that the director would be like, "No, I want, I want you to say it in with less, less tone in your voice. Uh, can you say it again with more deader boring. eyes? You know, like what? Can you look more bored? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also, uh, drinker, you mentioned tension there, right? There's, there's no, there's, there's no tension. There's no suspense at, well, at yeah. all. Um, it's because the characters aren't worried. They're getting attacked. Their lives are at risk, and they're just, you know, they're sitting there like they're flicking through channels on a TV show. They're just like, oh yeah, we'll do this and that, and and that then that conveys to the audience. Well, the characters aren't worried. Why should I be worried? Yeah, and because of Rosario well. Dawson smiling a few times in the middle of a of a battle. It's stupid. It's... You know, you know the other thing, right? That that just like made my brain melt um, is. The, the, the reason that they put themselves in such danger, right, is that they're approaching the fucking Eye of Sauron, whatever this stupid <laughs> thing is, right? And the droid is like, right, I need to scan it. And they're like, okay, scan. 
And he's like, this is very interesting. This is fantastic stuff, right? And then they're like, right, so we can fly away now. No, I have to complete my scan. It's like, okay, because we're only like 100 yards away from this fucking thing and they're really shooting at us now. They're like, no, we have to finish scanning this thing. And I just thought, seriously, have you not got enough now? Well, You've seen that what this thing is. You know where it is. You know it's like some hyperspace fucking uh, portal thing. That's enough. You can just go now. You don't need to scan every fucking square inch of this thing to know they're building something really dangerous and you need to stop it. It's, it's like even, that, yeah, that's that guy that's he's scanning everything. The droids was specifically the one that was uh, super protective, but didn't even like he was following rules and protocols, right? You tell me the protocol is always complete the scan even when your ship is about to be destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's oh, another fuck. point as well where um, Sabine asks him like, uh, oh, why why did we come out of hyperspace so far away? And he's like, well, it's standard protocol to like approach uh, by stealth. Uh, you know, it kind of goes into a detailed explanation, and she sort of rolls her eyes like, oh. Is he still doing this? And I was thought, I just thought to myself, bitch, you fucking asked him what you were doing, and he explained the answer to you. Why are you getting mad at him? <laughs> yeah, it's infuriating. What is this what? fucking script? Who wrote this? And then, you know, the purpose what's of worse? that, like, procedure. Oh, sorry, go, Reaper. I was just going to say, what's worse is that they're supposed to drop out from a distance for, like, safety, and yet they get ambushed immediately because they must have known exactly <laughs> Re then Re and where yes. they were going to drop out of. <laughs> that, yeah, Re Re they knew that, they'd be that, there. That, yes, that's exactly the thing I was going to say before. I, like, yes. I, yeah, I... I <laughs> What boggles my mind is it's actually a good procedure. Space is really, really big, right? And so if Liar. you drop out of hyperspace yeah. that far from a planet, <laughs> you're, you're talking about a, a circumference which is a thousand or more times bigger than the surface of whatever that planet was, right? Imagine trying to pinpoint the location of someone at that distance. It, it, it's beyond a needle in a haystack, and yet there were just people, you know, ships waiting there ready to attack them out of nowhere. Waiting and behind them. <laughs> But because you've got to be further than me, where they are. <laughs> call me crazy as well, right? But like, once you come out of hyperspace and you're just flying through regular space, like they can track you and they can detect you, right? So doesn't it make more sense to hyperspace in as close as you can, take a quick snapshot, like a quick scan of the area, and then hyperspace out again? It's like, okay, we've learned what we can here, and we're out. So it's so funny. Yeah. Know well, we were there. I mean, like the technology is so inconsistent with Star Wars at the moment. Once upon a time, you couldn't track someone through hyperspace unless you had a tracker on their ship. That was established in A New Hope. But, of course, with the Disney sequels, they had a, a whole thing that they could track us through hyperspace. And so I have freaking no idea what the, what the technology is capable of in this point in time it's just so it's it's funny, um, whatever the script writers say can be something done yeah. as his review highlight imagine in one of those ships you have one of those droids from the first episode that started a self-destruct and just flew next to them and then it would destroy everything it's like <laughs> why not do that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, self-destruct other ships themselves i don't know it's just funny as we're talking about this scene we're drawing it back and back in terms of motivations i uh when we were watching it with uh the efab lads we were like hang on why are they even going here? It's like to chase a big team of bad guys. Like, yeah, but you're just one ship. What if there's loads of bad guys? And then there were loads of bad well, guys, and then they just survived. It's where... I was saying it's where it's not, because uh, Hera calls and says, oh, all those reinforcements I were going to get, they're not coming. So she yeah. goes, well, yeah. let's just keep going anyway. I, I yeah. assume it's like, fine. Fuck it, yeah. we're going well, in but, anyway. But, 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 they were intending to bring a Listen, whole fleet already... with them. And then they're like, oh, we'll, just, we, yeah. we'll be just as effective as a whole fleet. We'll keep going. <laughs> I, I just, I don't get as well. Like, Hera, her, her sort of authority level seem to vary to whatever the script needs it to be. Because on the one hand, yeah. she seems to think, like, nothing's classified to me. I can do whatever I want because I'm a general and I'm super important. Like, okay, fine. And then you want to you want to um, send a mission to scout out an area where you've got reasonable um, cause to believe that there's a very dangerous enemy force there plotting the overthrow of your entire government, uh, and you need to ask a Senate subcommittee for fucking permission to do that. Like, what what are you? Like, what is your level the of main, authority? Um, because it seems like nothing is, yeah. is. She went on the mission herself in the previous episode, so because it's like if if I, you know, I'm. I'm Call me crazy, but surely a general has at least the authority to send like a couple of squadrons of you'd think, uh, yes, not that's right. sorry, but, X Wings or something. Yeah, that's like, what I was thinking. Like, you know, maybe redeploying the entire fleet might take a little bit higher authority, <laughs> or it might not. I don't know. But yeah, may, like a smaller level. Like, what about like just you know, 
Exactly. Send a frigate with them to, to, uh, and a, a squadron of fighters. They only, um, they only yeah. need to send a drone that's like the size of a basketball or a bee. They don't need to be <laughs> manned <laughs> at all, right? A scouting droid, yeah. On Empire yeah, Strikes absolutely. Back, yeah. Those probe droids. Um, and the or crazy also, thing is that, uh, I'd, I'd argue, kind of out of character for her to... In, when she realizes she cannot send anyone, she should be panicking. She's like, my friends have just gone there. And she, she should be rushing well, to get into a ship herself to get them out of there to help them no, to do whatever. Like, if it was to stay in character with her, based on her behavior so far, she would just send the mission anyway. She'd be like, um, fuck it, I'll just, I'll just send like a whole... A whole f- well, but she fleet, should be going. Like, a bunch of ships, right? And, uh, and I'll pick up the pieces with the, the Senate later. Yeah, that's, that's the she thing. Though. She shouldn't be phoning them up to say no one's coming. Lol, bye. She should be saying like I'm on my way because I the, the Senate have basically turned their mm. back on us. Um, if anything, I'm going to get you guys out because there's no way that we'll be able to do it on our own. Yeah, but whatever. Yeah. Nobody cares. All I, of the actors I, pretend like nothing's happening. I, I love that actually. That scene with the holograms um, of the Senate committee because yeah. one, they looked like a fucking DEI uh, commercial because it's like, <laughs> there's like. Two women, an Asian guy, a black guy, and an alien. No white. Take take a fucking <laughs> no guess at the one yet. demographic that's conspicuously absent there. But anyway, whatever. Um, but the, there's a point in the the conversation where they're like, "We're we're going to confer for a little bit, so we need some, um, you know, we need some privacy." And she leaves the room, and I just thought, "Why don't you just turn the holograms off? <laughs> like, <laughs> why does she have to go? You're not even physically I'll- there." <laughs> But also it seemed to be like so the main stupid. issue was they didn't have proof of Thrawn or proof that they were going for Thrawn. And I was like, I, I, wow, the general's word isn't enough. That's crazy. Well, it, okay. They, they say, oh, they say such stupid things. They're like, oh, the, the Empire is now scattered and their fleet is like all over the galaxy and, and stuff. So we don't need to worry about them. And I just thought, okay, like, say for the sake of argument, there's just a random Star Destroyer like roving around. That's a pretty big fucking That's threat. That's a huge problem. Right? So, like, that could vaporize a planet all by itself. Yes. Just by orbital well, bombardment. The... If that's there, you should fucking send things, you should send ships to deal with it. Would Not only that. The, the key element when it comes to remnants of an empire that you want to avoid. It's like probably a leader, probably a leader that binds them all. That's probably the yeah, last thing Something that need. can unify them all together. Uh... Yeah. And, and not like, only... even if there's a slim chance that he's back, it's like, well, it's it's worth checking out. I think you can allocate a few resources to this. And, and not only that, they just learned that there were Empire sympathizers that were basically running an entire construction scheme, re-equipping a fleet of ships. Like they were sending off these really key components, and they learned that some yeah. Empire sympathizers were rebuilding what must have been a fleet or something really big that required that hyperdrive, that would be such a massive alert. You would be like, holy crap, send the fleet to that location to find out what the hell these empires of Elithizers are building because that's such a huge threat. And they're like, nah, it'll be fine. <laughs> it's, it's nuts. They're like, you just want to fight Ezra, don't you? It's like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> I actually, I was there. I did the mission myself. They tried to kill me, the Empire-affiliated people. They escaped with the very precious resources. We don't know exactly what they're doing, other than intending to get thrown back to otherwise resurrect the Empire. I feel, I don't even know why she was there. Like you guys said, it's just like, can she not conduct a mission? Can she not organize a mission? Why does she need their approval? Shouldn't Don't you, think, Isn't... Don't you guys think that Thrawn should be a more fascinating character like for example in episodes uh four five and six or five and six when you start getting glimpses of the emperor it's sort of fascinating you can't wait for the next glimpse of him yeah right you, you really you you're really sort of drawn in to to the whole mystery of that whereas for really? me it seems like the well he originally was where it's like yeah i suppose you're supposed to be this huge giant overarching character and everything but i and maybe i'm just too cynical now i'm too old and cynical but i'm seeing like oh, i don't i I don't, well, I don't really seem to care about him that much, and I don't know uh, why. His, well, you're I'm right. with you, history, bro. To, aren't you? Like, you're yeah, I, 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 I haven't watched um, Rebels and only bits of Clone Wars, so I don't know anything about Thrawn apart from what they're trying to introduce us to him in Mandalorian and now Ahsoka, and I could not give two stuffs about this character. I like He doesn't feel intimidating. He doesn't feel like an imposing threat. And the reason why it really worked with the Emperor is Darth Vader was such a freaking badass. He was so intimidating. And then you see him kneeling to this, you know, figure in the hologram, and you're yeah. like, "Holy crap! That that says something." 
here, all the villains have been just wet blankets, and and uh, it's been a fail on so many well, levels. That okay. we're, we're three episodes fair, down, Shan. right, and we haven't even like we've obviously not seen a glimpse of Thrawn, so we don't know anything about him really. We've had some vague references to him being dangerous, like that's that's not enough to make us care about this character. Yeah, and but I think... imagine Morgan Elspeth kneeling to him. Wow. Wow. But that's never going to happen because of you know, no. the reasons that we all know. She kneels on his neck. Do you remember? Do you remember? Yeah. How, uh, you remember how he'll well kneel to her. Though, he'll yeah. kneel to her and be yeah. like, oh, you know what? You, yeah. you are the one. He'll turn to John Snow. Of, uh, the glimpses of the Emperor you got in the original three films, how well done it was, um, how sort of light touch it was. Um, yeah. Again, playing with the idea of uh, tension and suspense and mystery, um, it seems like that's a completely forgotten skill, or not even forgotten, just just thrown away. Well, you know, I think they attempt it. They just don't have the talent to carry it through. Like, like again, the, the characters don't feel worried, so we don't feel worried. And uh, the fight scene when they're trying to fight off the attackers when they arrive at the system, right, I think they tried to do emotion. Like, there's one part where uh, Sabine or whoever the purple-haired lady is, she shoots someone and she, she cheers and they're trying to do emotion, mm. but it's not carrying through. They're not pulling it off it by any means. And there's just, you're right, there's no tension there as a result, and you're not well, invested. The, well, that was the Ray problem. Like, she comes in and shoots, like, three TIE fighters in one shot and goes, I like this. And you're like, okay, it's supposed <laughs> to be a serious scene, but she's just having the time of her life killing everyone. <laughs> it's, that's the problem. These characters are just unbelievable. Like, the, like, Sabine is having fun being completely overwhelmed by, like, this giant ring and loads of TIE... Uh, what are they called? They're not TIE fighters, are they? Oh, the discount like... TIE fighters, yeah. Those, those well, ships look awful. They they look like those stupid little stunt racer things from the 1930s that would do like barnstorming and stuff, but they turned them into starfighters. Like that's that's literally. They even yeah, make I feel the like kind they're of they're like... modeled on um, Japanese zeros. I don't know if anyone else thought that. You know, like World War II Japanese yeah. fighters. That are, I think it's just because they had the little stubby wings. It made me think of the Rocketeer when they had those little like racing planes. You know, they they just look like that kind of thing. Uh, Do you think they spent like... all the money on the giant ring? So they went, oh no, we don't have enough money left for these uh, ships, so we'll just put like laser pointers on them. I think so. <laughs> so they just they're, spent they're, everything, they're, yeah. Because their gunfire does nothing, like you pointed out. Like Even when the shields are down uh, and they're shooting at Ahsoka and it, it glances off the, the wings and the hull. Literally it hits even... the ship. Not a scratch. doesn't even leave a scorch mark or anything. Like, I couldn't like, believe oh, it. What is this? And that's the point about stakes and, and tension. Like, we're supposed to be worried that the ship, the shields have lowered. Well, you've shown us that they do nothing when they hit with no shields anyway. So what are we, why are we supposed to freaking care? Yeah, like, the, uh, the what... bit when, like, there's six of them initially, and then, you know, Sabine blows up a bunch of them, and then two of them chase them down into, at, into the atmosphere of the planet, and they're still firing away at them while the, the fucking zero gravity space whales are flying around as well like what the fuck is this <laughs> shit? anyway <laughs> he has it but i was like well what I'm, I'm even less invested now because if six of these fucking things couldn't damage the ship what are two of them gonna do who even cares if they score a hit it doesn't it doesn't do anything you're not gonna damage this thing you clearly you can't know, i said uh... i'm sorry Reaper, come on. Oh, i was gonna say well i said dave filoni has this obsession with whales like, he must be like a gay fish because it just keeps going. He puts them in everything. <laughs> They're now, like, intergalactic space-traveling fish. They travel they, galaxies got, now. They've got hyperspace migration routes, don't they? Uh, and well, like, and they, Do they have, like, a hyperspace <laughs> so, shoved up their arse what or do they, yeah. How do they even... Uh, as a concept, um, like as a concept, I'm not opposed to it, but the execution is really oh. poor. They actually look like whales, and uh, and do you, like if they migrate through hyperspace, to me that would imply that these are creatures that literally live in space. But now you have them flying in an atmosphere, counteracting a planet's gravity for some reason. They're just magical giant fish at the moment that how can do. They, how do they fly between gal it would, galaxies? It would be like us saying, like, oh, that's the, the supersonic geese over there that migrate <laughs> from like New yeah, York to right. London in two minutes. <laughs> Those whales are just absolutely absurd. The most ridiculous, absurd thing. Uh but just going back to the laser thing real quick, did did you guys notice, you know when the big the big ring thing starts firing its giant cannon? And oh, it's, firing, lasers, yeah. it's firing like green lasers, but it's also like 
World War Two era flak with exploding yeah, it's, it's, shells it's at the exploding. end. Of it. it's like, yeah. Yeah. Exploding yeah, what is laser it exploding shells? against? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, again, it's like they they took these basic concepts of like I guess in the same way that Lucas did uh, World War Two flak cannons and just said right we're going to port it into this this space setting and they didn't yeah. think even the slightest about how it actually would function or what it is or anything. It's just yeah. I wonder what the process is when like Dave Filoni writes a, a first draft. Uh, how many eyes in the production staff read that and they're like yeah that's good go with that that that's fine. I, don't, I think I, the, he I scrolls it in crayon. Process, really. I, I, I think with half the letters backwards, and then like they're just <laughs> like, "Yeah, nice one, Dave. Good, uh, good job. Just let him do what he wants." Well, here's his child drawings. Is the final thing? I don't know. You might be right. Like, he's the one writing this, and yeah, yeah it, it could have done to have a few more eyes well, on it. What What annoyed me is where they go. We lost track of them. And then Shin goes, I know where they are. And I was just like, your weapons are useless. Just tell her where they are and just keep firing those turbo <laughs> cannons on them. And he just never did. He just went, don't worry. I, my thing that never worked beforehand, I'll just keep doing it. I just think uh, it's so funny that we've lost track of them. And you just then you get a shot of it just drifting through the drifting, ring. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's right there. Look out the window. <laughs> How can no one see this? And uh, like... <laughs> Yeah, there are so many times when there are real basic logical um, con like options that you could resort to in a lot of these scenes, and the writers are just—it's oblivious. Like, like, you know, the general not being allowed to bring the fleet. Okay, send a couple of squadrons. Se send an escort. Send. Send. You, you do have. A, you probably have a personal ship. Get on board. Go, go. Send with that. When they go onto the planet and they lose track of Ahsoka and everything like that, if I was trying to, you know, take it this person out and I found out that they've landed somewhere amongst the trees, but we can't find them in the trees. Okay, let's shell the entire area, blow it to hell from orbit, and they don't have shields, so I don't have a feeling they're not going to survive that. But, oh, no, now we just have to scour through the trees or something like that. And they just... Nah. Yeah. I was just going to say, because three of them have the force, why can't they censor? And then Balin yeah. is already on the ground waiting for them. It's like, why is Balin standing where the map is? Shouldn't he be on the ring? Because he knew Ahsoka was going to be on the planet. Because that's what just they're going to have yeah. a fight. What was his strategy as well? It's like, okay, we got the map and everything. And I'm just going to fucking stand here now. <laughs> I'll stand here because I know Ahsoka. This is just I know where I, this weapons. is just. Yeah, this is just like where I live now. Yeah. Uh, and I'm oh, sorry, Chad. I was just going to say, because there are some people that say, well, Shad, you know, they, they can't resort to those options because then Soka would die and the story wouldn't happen. The purpose of being a good writer <laughs> is addressing those things. To me, if I was in a situation like this where, okay, I need the main character, Ahsoka, to live, all right, but then there are all these options for the bad guy to kill him, I find that as a really fun type of challenge to now, this is an opportunity for the character to do something inventive to actually overcome Ooh. these problems that would be coming upon her but a bad writer they just pretend they don't exist as well, she lands and she's fine yeah. as the, as the thing, saying goes like with... a character can only be as smart as their writer yeah i think i well... think with, with like the, the essence of drama is that you put your characters in a really sticky situation like uh, perhaps on the face of it an impossible situation and then they get out of it that that's basically drama in a nutshell and hopefully you don't use a deus ex machina too obviously or you don't use to some absurd MacGuffin too too often, you know, make it inventive like MacGyver or something. Try and make it a bit believable. And again, well, all that just seems to have been thrown out of the like the idea those space whales. Do you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of if you let a little kid uh, do a stream of consciousness, and they say something like, "Oh, and there's giant space whales now," and you're like, "Well, that's ridiculous," and be quiet. Right? Well, there's thought, a lot to drop on people, I think. Even if you've seen the fucking cartoon version, I guess. To me, I, I just on the space whale thing, it feels like Dave Filoni is ripping off a lot of things from Treasure Planet because they had space whales. They had a map that was a globe circular thing that yeah. you had to rotate stuff on. And, and even the thing that they put the map in, in Treasure Planet, where they land on a planet and they put it in this thing that they have that as well. And this is like, come on. I mean, I know it's a great movie, but, but like... Writers are not he's above stealing ideas from other people. Like that's that's the big. But he's stealing it from Rise of Skywalker. So yeah, I was saying he's going to stealing from Rise of Skywalker, which is stealing from Treasure Planet. So he's stealing <laughs> off a thing that's already stolen. 
Imagine <laughs> stealing ideas from Rise of Skywalker. <laughs> oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. Oh, man, this show. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, it had the same thing, didn't it? The ancient map on this thing that led to Thrawn. The same thing, like an ancient dagger, which leads to the Death Star. <laughs> It's yeah, the same like, like wow, well, they, they knew exactly how that thing was gonna crash on the planet, didn't they? <laughs> Good lord. Oh, I, 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 I could have just left already. Like, imagine it just worked yeah. out that way. They just already left, they'd already gone. Yeah, they, they, they go through all this process to get to where Thrawn is, and he's already gone to another galaxy or something like that. It, and they got a tracker on him. If they traveled to the next like galaxy, would they read that and be like, Well, we can't chase him? <laughs> like, we can't do that, so fuck. <laughs> Does that map um, point directly? It seems to point directly at Thrawn. So has he got like a tag on him? So if he moves, does the map move? Because well, well it seems supposedly. Very specific. Well, you're right, actually. Because oh. so I, I was thinking that it points to this other mysterious galaxy. That ancient people discovered this forgotten hyperspace laneway to this other galaxy that ancient people then recorded. Uh, but it, the map is actually pointing to a specific planet in that galaxy. Yeah. and uh, It's pointing. And, it's got a tracker yeah. on a man who doesn't exist. For like another thousand years. <laughs> so yeah, I would like. I wonder if they'll even try and address that. That the connection between why does this ancient map point to the current location of Thrawn, and how did they connect yeah. that one map would lead to the other? Do I think they just think they'll, ignore they'll it. Try and, they just think they'll try and address any. No, of these they'll ignore it completely because they're no, like, no, just don't think about it. Just eat it up, you mindless yep. fucking seals. Yeah, it's yeah. just um, that's that's all we've got with this this show. And the thing is, Didn't there they... seems to be this weird, um, I don't know, like people seem to be, exp like seem people seem to be um, thinking this is smarter than it really is. That's that's the weird thing about this show. Like with Boba Fett and stuff, like people were unanimous and like this, this is stupid garbage. But with Ahsoka, there seems to be almost this veneer of like intelligence behind it. Um, and I'm not sure where it's coming from. Well, well I, Thrones, I, a lot of people were saying it was still good. Then by episode six, everyone went, nah, it's terrible. And I think a lot of it's cope. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. And a lot of people don't think too deeply about it. They're very surface level viewers. And I can, I can relate. Sometimes there's movies I go in where I just, you know, you, you watch and you're not really thinking too deeply about a lot of stuff. Uh, and, uh, so there's that, and and with uh, with that taken in, if you think that people aren't thinking about it too deeply, nothing really has happened that's a big slap in the face to the normie viewer yet. And there's enough posturing of, uh, you know, like like when when Ahsoka is teaching Sabine in episode three. To me, that was just kind of posturing, pretending that it's better than what it really is. Because if you look closely at the moves and what you're saying, like this is actually pretty boring and basic. And why are they using like staffs that have an edge on them when they're supposed to be, you know, represent lightsabers and, and stuff like that. But for a surface level viewer, they're probably thinking, oh, this is this is good old Star Wars. They're talking about force and training and, and all that and that. And... Well, I've got a question. I've got a question. Who is this Dave Filoni, really? I mean, who is he? Uh, let's get a physiognomy check on him to begin with. But what was he to begin with? Does anyone know, like, wasn't he just so, a voice actor? He was a voice actor, wasn't he? No, so, he, what, like, he ran so, the no, departments. I know, I know he's been around for a long time, but he's not a great novelist, is he? He's obviously a terrible storyteller in the true sense of the word. He can't tell a story. I think he, he cut his teeth on, on um, Clone Wars, Wars and yeah. then Rebels. Um, and, so and he was, was kind of responsible you know, then. He was but under they, the wing they, of George Lucas, right? As part of why he has a, an affinity with the fans. It, it, what was that? Yeah, what it's kind of like how, again? yeah, it's kind of like how J.J. Abrams got a bit of a nod from Steven Spielberg once upon a time, and like he, you know, in his eyes, he was like the anointed one, and so it's kind <laughs> of the same with Dave Filoni, um, in that you know he did these relatively successful shows that were kind of aimed more for a, a child audience. Um, I know they grew into something a bit more than that, but um, that that's how he got his start. And he was seen as just almost like an heir apparent to the, the Star Wars um, lore and the Star Wars universe. And he but somehow like, managed to make a name for himself. Thinker, is, my question is, but why though? Because it not doesn't seem to be based on any any real talent. Well, you know, like, I mean, I, I, I can think... I can look up his Wikipedia page and see what he did. But it doesn't seem. Why give this giant responsibility to him? Why? I, I think yeah. Like, say what it will do. Um, say. 
He's yeah, probably one of the more like, qualified people they've given yeah. this book to in a while. <laughs> and like, <laughs> well. everyone least, else is... <laughs> sorry, at the Jager. very least, he, he's got some kind of like love for Star Wars, but Does he, doesn't he? Have the, he doesn't have the writing talent to back it up. Because I'm willing to believe he loves you, Star Wars. He's just, you know... Well, <laughs> well the thing is, when, you, when, you've got about, when you've got about 200 episodes of a kid's show to like gradually like uh, refine your ideas down, you've got plenty of breathing room. But when you've only got six episodes of this live action show where you really have to make an impact and make your point quickly and concisely, uh, he he's fallen short. That's the problem. Yeah. And on the uh, does he love Star Wars or not? I think, you know, I could concede perhaps he loves it, but I think he loves his characters that he is making vastly more than the legacy yeah. characters and stuff. Like this is really the yeah. Ahsoka show and the Rebels sequel and you can see that see, there's a big focus on that. The, there's there's people who would um, point to his involvement in the Mandalorian being to its detriment, because mm. the 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 feeling was that John Favreau had a really good idea for a TV show, um, which you know he was able to implement to some extent in season one. But Dave Filoni was pushed into it by Kathleen Kennedy. Uh, she keeps talking endlessly about like, oh, I'm so proud of the fact that I brought these two talents together. And it's like, no, you, you fucking shoehorn Dave Filoni into a show that he didn't need to be involved in. Um, and, and Favreau's like, trying to leave. Yeah, like now Favreau is just like, fuck it, I'm out. I don't, I don't give a but shit like about the, this the anymore. The quality of like, his writing, yeah, like he, you know, the dialogue, was, it's terrible, isn't it? Well, this is the thing. Like Filoni just kind of saw it as an opportunity to bring all of his characters in um, into live action. And so that's all he cared about. Um, and so it became t kind of to the the show's detriment, and now he's he's fully in charge of Ahsoka because I think John Favreau was just like that. Ah, I'm done. I'm done with all this bullshit. Um, and so you know he's not he's not necessarily a creative powerhouse with uh, within the Star Wars well, world. He, uh, he's created this. He's wrote this by himself. It's all and John Favreau is just an executive producer. So he's like, yeah, put my name on it. Don't care. And like yeah. he's he's got full creative control, and it's terrible. Yeah. So like, drinker, you know of, about writing, right? There's more than one thing going on. There's like this the overarching sort of plot, you know, character arcs, and the, the the bigger picture, and then there's the individual lines of dialogue. It seems like Filoni is terrible at, at all of it across the well. Board. I this this is the thing that's interesting right because if you look back to uh, rebels and clone wars like these characters had a lot more life to them um you know they Hera, did. ahsoka like they actually had personalities and they, they they were funny they were like warm they were charming at times uh, they they had all these things and uh it's like in this one all of their personalities have just been bleached out and they, they're just these weird robotic um nothing burgers of characters it's it's odd i don't know if he had a lot of help when he did those animated shows and like it's, it's the work of other people that wasn't getting recognized or um if he just thought like i need to make it more serious now i need to make this something that people will take seriously and uh, that's why the characters have got no character anymore don't know what it is but like back in the day he seemed to be responsible for for good writing he isn't now and you're right. When I think about it, I can't really think of why the difference is so striking because I think about Ahsoka and these characters. Like, was there is there a single moment that I've considered that was fun or charismatic or there was good banter and there was like an, and a nope. truly elevated, uh, you know, enjoyable moment? And like, I compare it to when um, Han is captured by Jabba the Hutt and he meets up with Luke and is like, um, how are we going? Same as always. That bad, huh? And it's, it's just it's just a fun, witty dialogue where they're, you know, they're, they're even in a serious situation, they're kind of they're bantering, yet they're trying to deal with stuff, and there's good character happening there. There's none of that in this. And no. well, he was a I, he was a knowledgeable workhorse. He knew all about Star Wars, and he's fine in a group. But like once he left the stables, he's shit all over the place, and everything's just disaster <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing like that's what he is he's a workhorse that shouldn't yeah Sorry. i mean I, I think it's like you know people rise to their level of incompetence and like this is clearly his and yeah it's just like you, you promote someone beyond their abilities this is what you end up with and we have seen I even under the disney umbrella you can create something you're not it's not impossible 
Like, uh, they managed to squeak Andor out, so it's not like Dave Filoni couldn't have put strong writing in there. It's not like someone breathed over his shoulder and prevented him. Shad said something earlier, which I thought was interesting. He talked about it trying, it being try hard. I feel like it, quite a lot of that is going on, where all the, the very, very long pauses, the sort of needlessly drawn out things, the... Uh, obviously, it looks great. I think it does. You know, the visuals are very good, you know, high budget. But it's trying to be really, really serious and really, I don't know, cool. I don't know if that's quite quite the right thing. It's just trying to be above what it what it, it really it's... is. Like, the guts of it is, is shit. And it's trying to make itself brilliant. And it's just, it doesn't I, work. I think it... Yeah, I, th I agree. I, I think it confuses like long drawn out pauses with like deep, thoughtful contemplation. Uh, right. And it's almost like the, the assumption like, well, okay, if a character takes five minutes before they actually say something, like whatever they say will be deep and profound. And it's, it's just, um, it's, I think Reaper, you like coined a phrase perfectly. It's like it, Ahsoka says shit that you would get in a fortune cookie. You know, like the yeah. anger and aggression is a path to power, but it puts you off balance. Like that's that's the kind of stupid, like meaningless uh, epitaph yeah, you yeah. would get on like well, a, an on, on well, a fortune Well, she kicked her cookie. over. Yeah. yeah, she kicks it and goes, "You're unbalanced." She went, "No, you unbalanced me." <laughs> <laughs> Fucking trip me up, you bitch. Yeah, the, the, like, the, that oh, whole training been... sequence because like compare that to like obviously the obvious point of comparison is from A New Hope when Luke's got the the lightsaber and the the helmet on and he's got the training droid there. That, yeah. that sequence is very quick, like very efficient, um, just tells you what you need to know about the force and like what it allows you to do. Uh, the Ahsoka training sequence, the same exact thing goes on for the first 10 minutes of the show. Like the first 10 minutes of episode three is just this really boring, um, like laborious fight sequence with like, nonsensical dialogue pepper in it. Uh, it accomplishes Outside nothing Outside of training. Meaningful. Outside of training, uh, what do they talk about? Because it's just, I'm training. He goes, oh, yes, training's hard. Then after the training session is, wow, that training session was hard. He goes, yeah, it does. Yep. They don't talk Redundant about anything dialogue. with the training. Well, it's also they're like, super they're generic like dialogue acquaintances. too, right? The force is in all of us. The force is all around us. You must focus. Yeah. And it's like, say something new. Again, I wonder yeah. what like the editorial process was. If there was any, that he turns up with some pages that say stuff like that and that he wants... 10 minutes of this fight scene and there's there's no kickback against there's no there's no one else to bounce it off of to say actually no that's not the best idea or maybe we can edit this or it, it just seems like it's the first draft of everything yeah i i don't know if this is when people get too much uh creative control all right because maybe, I, maybe i'll tell you this that. much maybe man like that. Like even just like the the limited experience I've had of like screenwriting and stuff for like for films and things, um, you you get like multiple people then giving their views on what you've written and saying like, well, how can we tighten this up? How can we like inject a bit more meaning into this? What's this character doing? What's that character like thinking at this point? You you get so many perspectives on it, and ultimately, if you listen to them, you'll end up with a much better product at the end. Uh, it's like you say, it's like there was nobody. Uh, screening any of these ideas. It's like mm, Dave mm. Filoni was just, the, you know, given a free reign. It's like whatever bullshit you well, come how, up with uh, in your first draft, like, sure, we'll just do that. And That's, how uh, much of a tyrant is he? Because he's a male feminist and he keeps going, oh, he, he's jam-packed, it full of women. And we all know male feminists are snakes. So, like, you'll probably say <laughs> something <laughs> next, next thing. You know, your car doesn't work in the building and you're out. So, when we're That's talking about them... It's no, go Reaper. No, I was, you go. I, I was just saying, because when we'll talk about how that was very generic force conversation in the training scene, th there was something new, but it kind of threw me. It's that, hang on, do people with no force aptitude, do they, can they learn, now learn the force? Or like, if you just believe in it really hard, you can master the that. ways of the force? That that honestly seems like what Apparently, they're going yeah. for, like like because like the, the the mechanics of the force and who's force sensitive and stuff seems to vary between movies, TV shows, whatever. But like I think what they're going for here is like, well, if you just try really hard, you can learn the force and just do it. See, that um, strikes me as a massive contradiction. Like even with Disney Star Wars, how crap it's been, I think it's been mostly consistent that you need to have aptitude with the force to be able to really yeah. do it. Well, I, I here the the droid is straight up saying like, 
She's She's like, crap. crap. Uh, Statistically, she is the worst candidate I have ever seen in my thousand years of like working with the Jedi, and she has no force powers whatsoever. And I just thought she shouldn't be fucking doing this. Yes. It's like if I had no eyes, I wouldn't be a. I wouldn't go for a driving test to try and to try and drive a car. You know what I mean? Like, there's certain things you just need to be able to do this stuff. Ah, but But drinker, have you considered this? So, so, but wait, wait, have we considered this? She is a woman. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. No, it's a, sure, it's yeah. a cool aspect to have. It's like, why not be someone who can use the Force, I guess? The, we haven't actually got anything from anyone... Sabine why she wants to be a Force user. We why haven't got in anything it. from anyone. Like, yeah, Reaper pointed sure. this out in his review. It's like, okay, we've we've had three episodes now with, uh, with the antagonists. No fucking idea why any of them are doing the things that they're doing. What do they want? They want power. Okay, why? What are you going to do with that power? Don't know. Don't care. It's not important. It's just they're bad guys. That's all we're going to get. That's not character There's no writing. dynamic. Like, they... like, a power isn't a fucking end. It's a means to an end. It's a means for you to do something. So what is your, your end goal? Don't know. I once saw uh, I once saw an interview with George Lucas, and it, um, earlier on I said the the essence of drama is that you put characters in a tight spot that they can't get out of, and then they get out of. I, I, I saw George Lucas saying that. What he actually said was, in any three act drama, act one is you introduce the characters and set them up and their motivations, then you put them in a difficult situation that they can't get out of, and then they get out of it. He hasn't done even the first step, that first step of setting them up. What are their motivations exactly? You know, what? Why would? Why am I supposed to care about Sabine? Other than that, she's got short purple hair and is obnoxious. I'm going to say as well, like there? that haircut was the biggest fucking downgrade I've seen in a long <laughs> yes. time. It's like now, now you just look like fucking simple Jack. <laughs> 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 Simple Jack is a look, okay, you know. And maybe it's a I mean, bit obvious to say, but it's she's, she's just she's just not believable. Nor is Rosario Dawson as sort of intimidating or scary in any way that, that that they're supposed to be. You know, that Sabine, she's she's a tiny little frame. She's got like the tiny skinny little arms and no shoulders whatsoever. You know, big lollipop head well, and a whole tiny point... little frail body. It's not. She's not a warrior in any way. Is it? Is it just but me? What they're trying to do is seize that. She's right? going to have no force powers. She's going to have no force powers, and then at some point later on, with either Shin or the guy from Dark Souls, and she's just going to go, "I can use the force," and just like hit it with like this power she'll have. It'll be like Captain Marvel when she pulls the tracker and she just believes in herself. Yeah. She'll just have a big yeah, feminist be... moment where she'll use the force and win. Yeah, that's what's going to happen. Definitely. It's like I know it's a, I know it's a trope these days with like you know not ju- not even just in Star Wars like Ray but in all sorts of films uh, like Cara Delevingne can just punch a guy and he just flies across a room or something. Um, but it's just it's got to the point now where it's just really annoying, you know, because most people have seen most blokes right that are, that are grown up have seen hundreds of hours of boxing or MMA. Or they've been to school, they've seen real life fights, or they've been in real life fights, or they've got an older brother, they know about physicality. And it's just not believable that a little five foot two, 90 pound woman can do anything. It's just annoying to me at this point, right? Well, uh, clearly, you're a bigot if you think, yeah, yeah, I mean, like logical uh, lines. Yeah, you his, need history, that. bro, history, Proper bro, old school cancels. misogynist, me. <laughs> uh, like, history, bro, have you considered this, right? They are a woman. Oh, sorry. No, yeah, of course. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, yes, sorry. Yes. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I forgot. I forgot. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, I think that, yeah, I love that. That's, that's just your point. It's like they're a woman. They, um, well, that's the one. Get, there. Come on. I'll come never on. get over Sabine punching a robot in the fucking face and yeah. it somehow stuns it. it, it <laughs> that's it. it. I was, out, I like I was hand. out of that break fucking show. Yeah. Oh, or it man. just waited yeah. for Osoka to come back instead of just leaving or exploding. It just went, nah, I'll just stay. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, like we pointed out, um, you know, when when Ahsoka shows up at that place, it should have just immediately self-destructed. It's like cool, you'll kill her. You don't have to announce it. You don't have to try and attack her. Just, just tries to like grab her. <laughs> yeah. Uh anyway, well that's anyone that was think episode- the leaks are true. What, mm-hmm. what leaks? What leaks? I was just going to say one last thing. Um, mm-hmm. What they think is going to happen is she's going to go through the world between worlds and she's going to see Anakin on Mustafar because Hayden Christian is supposed to be in it. So she'll see these like 
scenarios of herself with in the past and the future because she did time travel in Rebels. I, I think they totally just do a flashback. I didn't didn't think they'd go further than that. If, 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 if Filoni's can, writing this, I can I can believe that. If if they can member bury bait people, they'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. I want to see Hayden Christensen, forty years old, trying to pretend that he's still twenty, um, with with no <laughs> CGI de aging or anything. Yeah, just go for it, go for it. Why not? Um, but yeah, that is the the delights that is Ahsoka. But hey, you know, there's other stuff going on in the world of entertainment, and one of those things is James Gunn, because you know, oh, no. th this seems to be a time right when um there's not a huge amount of news coming out of Hollywood and it gives people time to reflect on things that have happened previously. It's definitely happened with Rachel Zegler. I'm sure she can attest to that, but it's also happened with James Gunn. Um, this poor guy, he just makes really bad tweets and like they, they come out years later and <laughs> cause all kinds of problems for him. <clears throat> so Anyway, these, these are tweets that go back a few years, um, and it's, uh, it gives some of his insights into things like Batman and, uh, you know, the Tim Burton version, the Christopher Nolan version. Uh, and I'm, I'll just read out um, some of what the things he said. So on Tim, on Tim Burton's 1989 blockbuster, he wrote, quote, The Tim Burton Batman is poorly written. The soundtrack is the worst work of everyone involved, and it is absolutely one of the most boring films ever. <clears throat> Hang on, the soundtrack? He, he went after the soundtrack, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's iconic. <laughs> was it, was it's, it it's one of it's the most the iconic series. Yeah. Yeah. It's, the, it's in the animated series. They put it in because it's James, so good. why'd you do this? Why'd you do this uh, to us, James? The, the, <laughs> but wait. But wait, there's more. I'll give you more, more to chew on. Uh, he went on to say that the God. reveal of the Joker being responsible for the murders of Thomas and Martha Wayne was, quote, a nullification of the bottomless thirst for vengeance that necessarily drives Batman. Um, regarding the Joker, he said that Jack Nicholson's interpretation of the character was nothing more than Jack Torrance in clown makeup. And as for the hero, he found Keaton's voice ridiculous and the overall acting not even on par with the 1960s TV series. He concluded, and <laughs> bear, bear with me, and on top of everything, the dark creature of the night can't even move his fucking neck. Give me a fucking break. It's a ridiculous, awful film. Burton's Planet of the Apes was genius in comparison. So, yeah. He, he got... Well, he Joker was Jack amazing Nicholson. in that. Like, that, what? <laughs> Joker was amazing in that film. A lot of time, when it comes I... to casting preferences, we usually go by past performances and then how they might work within a different skin. And of course, uh, Jack Nicholson was a fan favorite choice to go for Joker. Why? Well, because he's Jack Nicholson. If you've seen him in a lot of his roles, we want him to portray a relative Jack Nicholson type person with a Joker cone of paint. So pointing out that he is. A, he's just Jack Nicholson playing a crazy person with clown makeup. It's like, uh huh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're saying that you're saying that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> isn't James Gunn? Isn't James Gunn that unconvicted pedophile? Is that the guy? Well, yeah, he did make a lot of. Uh, he's had past tweets. Jokes. I'm going to call it jokes about wanting to have uh, very intimate relations with boys. Um, There's also yeah. that party that was held or whatever. The so, in serious trouble, but um, so yeah, essentially, that stuff all came out when James Gunn was getting ready to oversee the entire cosmic phase of Marvel. Um, that was going to be phase four, was it? I think that, but he was going to be basically in charge of that. Yeah, those tweets came out, they had to fire him. Um, he went over to DC for a little while and did uh, the Suicide Squad, uh, and then you know. I guess they've got short memories in Hollywood when you, you say all the right things politically, and so they were happy to bring him on back. And so, like, yeah, he's he's uh, back there for a little while. He did Guardians 3 and uh, then left to do um, DC well, to oversee DC in its entirety again because it was a bigger opportunity. So he's a bit of an interesting one, is James Gunn. Um, I don't quite know what to make of him on a personal level, but I, I tell you, I mean, the things that he joked about, I wouldn't joke about stuff like that. And, you know, yeah. I'm a drunken asshole. I, I do have a question. I'm wondering where this kind of critical eye was when it came to The Flash. 
Oh, well, so that's the thing, right? So, so there's people in chat who are, who are going like, you know, you're know he's right about uh, Batman 89. There's plenty of people who don't like Batman 89. I understand. But when you combo it up with him saying that The Flash is one of the greatest superhero movies of all time, it becomes exactly. very fucking confusing. Well, yes. here, we, here we go as well. Not a good he has things to say, like, because, you know, people, people tend to look at the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy as being pretty good, generally. Okay. Uh, but James Gunn had his own things to say about this, and I'll give you a quote here. Um, quotes. Listen, I've got problems with both of Nolan's films. I don't think either one is a classic. I guess this is before the third one came out. And I don't even really think that Batman Begins is any good. But they're far superior to the first Batman. None of your defenses get by the fact that despite being the first cinematic dark take on Batman, so what? Stallone's Judge Dredd was the first take, sorry, first dark take on Judge Dredd. The movie is awful. Well, uh, well, hang on. Just because Dark, sorry, Judge Dredd had a dark take doesn't mean all dark takes of comic book properties are bad. Well, wait. He's saying that in response to somebody who said, you know, give credit where it's due. It was the first dark take. And he's saying, I don't give a fuck if it was the first dark take. It's okay. Shit. So, yeah, he's kind of like the. God. He's like, so the Nolan movies were shit. Uh, Gordon's <laughs> take was, was shit as well, even though it was like a dark take. But, like, just because it was the first doesn't make it any good. So. Uh, yeah, okay, I mean, he's pissing sure. off everybody now. <laughs> yeah, it's like okay, you, you it's like take both, every both of Batman fans and piss them off. Yeah, I would like Sorry, to. Is, uh, I, I, is, is he a pedo or not? No, no, no we don't, it's certainly not proven. Likely. It's just he's I, made I, jokes, I, and I don't want to label him as anything, but um, he's made off color jokes that, like, I, I at the very best interpretation, I would just label them as uh, poorly judged jokes, and at worst, you could probably make that claim about them. Yeah, it just I, depends I, which way you want to go. I would want to see. I can't remember the context and exactly what he said because I think that's a type of area that you shouldn't really joke about, depending on context. We avoid it, yeah. Yeah, but you definitely want to avoid that type of thing, especially if in the context of the joke, if you're saying you yourself are the pedo. I take that as a bit of a self-report, honestly, when people are trying to, I was like, oh, really? What are you saying there? Um, and this is different to like if you have a, 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 like a joke that's about pedophilia in the context of pedophilia being bad and awful. Like if you had a, a separate character that was representing how bad they were and, and you know, and or something like that. But if the context of the joke is that you are the pedo doing something awful, I have questions. I was like, really? Okay. Um, but I think in the context of like just his uh, his takes on you know all these different superhero movies, um, you know, like Moller said, you've successfully managed to p piss <laughs> off like every faction of uh, of DC fans, and so you, God, you've not left yourself much uh, much room. Uh, but he likes the Flash, though. He he claimed that it was like one of the greatest superhero movies ever made. I think Moller didn't he? Yeah, like he was, he was waxing that, yeah. lyrical about the, this one. The only reason I'm holding back on that is like, why would anyone ever fucking say that? But I'm pretty sure that's what he said. So. Well, isn't that Ezra Miller? Role I can't wait for well? his opinion on Aquaman together, don't they? I think. I, I yeah, I think uh, Ezra Miller's got his own issues. <laughs> yeah, he's got the wrong one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think with this one, there's an element of like, well, we've got a ton of money invested in the Flash. We have to try and sell it somehow. And so that's just eating shit and learning think... to like the taste, I guess. <laughs> Do you think he's going to say the same thing for Aquaman? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, probably. He's going to go, yeah, Aquaman is just... <laughs> He probably Oscar said winning. about Blue Beetle. Yeah, he probably said about Blue Beetle. It's a fantastic movie, great for for representation, and you should absolutely see it because it's uh, it's going to be integral to like DC going forward. I'm sure. Well, the the future slate's going to be terrible because he seems to just love dark stuff. Because the Supergirl movie is going to have a jaded Supergirl. Batman is being put with the assassin Robin, the most darkest side of Robin. So like, it just seems to want to dark all these like positive stories i i think oh, if, if you think look at what he's done with suicide squad and uh, even peacemaker he likes you know subversive um, dark cynical takes on, on yeah 
that was the word tropes. that yeah. was the word i was going to use subversive yeah just subverting anything that people like to make it which it, it, it worked it worked fantastically well with suicide squad because that's exactly what it, it's meant to represent and to some extent it worked pretty well with peacemaker as well because it was mm. uh you know a, a very goofy sort of um, deconstructed character that's not uh, what he claims to be uh, which is fine, but if you're putting him in charge of, say, a Superman movie, like it's meant mm. to be earnest, it's meant mm. to be uh, serious. You know, again with Batman, like that's not a character that you should deconstruct and and make, uh, you know, into a bit of a joke that everyone's in on. Like he's meant to be a serious character, and I just I don't really see how James Gunn's going to manage a film like that. Yeah, I'm very um, uh, doubtful about the success he'll be able to bring to Superman. And it, it also doesn't seem like a mistake that The Authority is going to be a film he's going to be doing far more or sooner than a lot of other ones, which I feel is a terrible mistake. The Authority does not fit well in a universe with the Justice League, but is doing it really, really soon. It, do you do you guys know anything about The Authority? Like, like I'm There's not, a gay like Batman and a gay Superman. Base, well, there's that. Yeah, that's, that's, like, that's, that's it. That's it's it's also hyper violent, like ex in the extreme. And look, it wasn't a bad comic. I read the comic and I actually thought it was pretty good, but it's the exact type of thing that James Gunn would like. And so you can see that's why he's prioritizing it. And also, I think that's a mistake because the authority is should not be done so soon. Um, in like, like, is it? I can't remember. Is it coming up before the Justice League? I think Super yeah Superman's first, then it's the Authority. Well, he has Creature uh, Commander before that. To me, that's insane. The squad. Yeah, yeah, like the the Authority are so hyper violent and stuff like that. They're the type of group that I would see the Justice League having a big issue with and going to fight against them because well, the Authority. Like the also, yeah, exactly. It's 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 going to be a bit like the boys. Um, yeah. But the thing is, the authority actually, they're, they're, they're not evil. They're like the boys are just evil superhero people posing as superheroes. The authority actually, they, uh, their intentions are to try and make a better world according to they see, as they see fit. And they actually go into other countries and just wipe out the governments of those countries because they don't like them. And so there, there's, a, there's some real interesting kind of political positions that they take. And because they're so ruthless, I would actually expect like a traditional justice league with the, their morals and standards that they would oppose the authority and that they, they I can. So the fact that it's happening so soon just does not make sense to me. Well, they'll oppose them until they kiss super gay Batman and gay. Superman. <laughs> yes. Oh no, it's <laughs> the, the homosexuals. I can't do anything. And Superman doesn't know what to do. <laughs> well, I, They've got Themyscira, which is going to be a bunch of women killing a bunch of men for like eight episodes. <laughs> like you guys need to open your minds up. That sounds like fun. <laughs> oh god, that sounds <sighs> awful. Then what have we got uh, again? Uh, we got Green Lantern, the... but it's dark. Dark. Who detective? He called it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So everything subverses, as you said. So yeah, like I, I think uh, with with James, like there's like two, I guess there's two prongs to this problem. Like one, he's uh, he's trying to reboot a, a pretty unhappy cinematic universe at a time when people aren't really that interested in com in superhero movies anymore, um, with a bunch of movies that really only appeal to him. Um, but also, like, he's, you know, you're getting tweets like this resurfacing, whereas, like, you just see his absolute disdain for things that are generally quite beloved and quite uh, appreciated by comic book fans. And so when you, you combine those two things, like, really, what is there to like about what he's doing? What is there to get excited about? Nothing. It's it's a pretty pretty grim picture that this paints for DC. Like, if this is the guy who's in charge of it, and... I, I will genuinely be surprised if he even gets the opportunity to bring most of this stuff to fruition. I, I could see all of it just getting canned. Yeah, like the, if the point. first if the first few bomb, um, uh, Warner Brothers would just pull out and just abort the whole thing. It's Superman. That's the uh, key because Superman yeah. is the foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Batman that, as well. Like they, they need yeah. Batman movies to succeed. <laughs> but even that, that character is so fucking diluted now. Like you've mm -hmm. got the 
well, you had the Ben Affleck Batman, you've got the Robert Pattinson Batman, you had the the Michael Keaton Batman that started making a comeback. Um, you've got so many different actors playing this same character. Like, there's not even a, a unified um, thing that people can like really coalesce around. Like, there's so many different versions of him. He's been diluted. It seems to me that quite often it's sort of subversion for subversion's sake. Uh, maybe correct me if you think I'm being too cynical here, but like take, for example, what they did with Luke Skywalker. It's like, here's something, here's a character that is, as you say, sort of beloved by a generation, more than one generation, a, a character that millions of people sort of love and identify. Well, let's subvert him inside out. Let's make him revolting, disgusting now. Like, I there's think... no reason for that other than subversion for its own sake, other than to rub the fans' noses in it deliberately, absolutely deliberately. I think subversion right? has become the cool, well, at least it was for a while, the cool thing to do because it's like you as a, a writer, a director, or whatever, um, a creative. Uh, being able to say, well, screw the rules and screw what came before. Like I'm putting my own stamp on this, and I'm gonna, yeah, um, yeah. I'm gonna do what I want to do with this character. Wait, it's wait. it's a it, it's like the sort of punky, um, f you know, middle finger to everything that came before the like the conventions. Uh, that's the the philosophy behind it. But like what you replace it with has to be good. That's what it all hinges on. If you subvert it, but you replace it with something even cooler and more interesting and more exciting okay fine you've succeeded but they they most of the time their aspirations and their intentions far outstrip their actual ability to deliver a creative mm. uh, end product that's they don't the problem. be making stories that are normal <laughs> like, for lack of a better term they'll be like oh that that'll be boring like oh i guess the guy just wins or the you know the bad guy's defeated that's lame what if the bad what guy do, was really what do you complicated think it, do you think in some cases it's just like I've got a cool story I want to tell? Like, oh, fine, I've got to do it within the fucking. Sometimes um, I wonder, like, honestly. the constraints of like Batman or Luke Skywalker or whatever. But it's like ultimately I'm just telling my own story and I'm, I'm just in the... business for myself. Uh, well, I think it, that plays a big part. Uh, but at the same time, I think a lot of these people are activists and these traditional characters are problematic and they want them to be done away with, moved on. And so mm -hmm. if they have to actually work with these characters to any level, well, they're going to be belittled. They're going to be washed up has-beens and losers and they're going to be replaced with a far more progressive and, you know, uh, someone that ticks the right... Oh, sorry, yeah, checks the right tick boxes. I, think, I, think I always think, like, point. how... Uh, how hateful and how insecure yeah. and how cynical would you have to be to despise a character like Luke Skywalker? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what I always think. That, like... That's exactly the point I was going to make. I think that it is activism and it comes from a place of spite and hate. Um, I don't well, think it's necessarily like trying to be cool or anything like that. Well, don't forget no, incompetence. It's... Right. Well, yeah, well, that's well, definitely a big thing. Yes. Most people. Say most people got the jobs by getting on their knees, so you would be quite spiteful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. this this isn't a conspiracy like. theory. Well, the, the, this hate that they have for these traditional heroes, this isn't a conspiracy theory. They've been overt about it. Like, well, there was that job interview for that person going to work for G4, and one of the questions was, like, what is your feelings about Batman and why is he a fascist or so, why is he bad or something like that? Like, why why they, are billionaires evil? Yeah, yeah, they hate Batman because he was a white rich guy. And, you know, for the same reasons that Superman is problematic, Luke Skywalker and stuff like that, they've been pretty darn overt. Like Kathleen Kennedy, the force is female. What are they saying by that? It's pretty darn clear. It's like these male heroes are problematic. We are going to get rid of them. The force is female. And that's, by the way, same with the fans, you know. Uh, we, we want uh, you know all the it's been a predominantly male enjoyed franchise, but no, sorry, we, we don't want those fans anymore. And then they try and recater it to people who are just not interested in it, and it bombs as a result. I I, I always laugh at it when uh, when they try to do it and they think they're being really subtle, <laughs> but like when <laughs> when you see what they're doing, it's like I don't know. Say for example, Falcon and the Winter Soldier when he's like uh, having a rant, it's like. Uh, against that senator guy it's like well okay you have to rant against the man because you can't possibly criticize a woman like the the um 
the the senators meeting that we just like referenced in the latest episode of Ahsoka. It's like you've got everyone represented except like white guys. <laughs> Like it's just interesting. It's lit. It's like a million tiny little things like that. None of them by themselves mean anything. But like, correct. They all just they all the, just stack up. And like once you notice it, you can never unsee it, and it just keeps happening. Yes, again, I, I'm, and I, again and again. Well, who was I'm the, in the exact same that conversation? I was saying who's the because the progressive stack. The way it works is white man evil. But then, since there's no white man in the room, who was the next one? It's Asians. Yeah. So the Asian guy was the evil one because they're Schrodinger's white. They're white when there's no one else. <laughs> then they're, they're not oh, white. These, guy, these guys like succeed really well. We need to. Then it's the black guy. The black guy's yeah. next on the chopping block. Then it'll be the um, ginger woman. Then it'll be. The, you can tell yeah. the order it's gonna go. Yeah. But, dr but drinker, I'm in the exact same situation where, like, a lot of these things in isolation, uh, you wouldn't, it wouldn't bother you, you wouldn't notice or anything. But it's the collective thing that happens again and again and again, where, you know, yeah, like a, a single isolated girl boss in a TV show, there are girl bosses in real life, whatever, it, it, that's not a problem. But when you see it all the time, yeah. you, you, you see the agenda at play. Yeah, it's reached you, you start to see lengths, the rules, right? You start I mean, to see the rules that well, are at play in Ashoka. It's that case, isn't it? Like you see a white guy in it, and you think, well, he's he's either just dead meat, or he's he's the evil guy. It's, it's as simple <laughs> as that. Like there's, there's only three. Uh, so there's I'll only just... three roles for a white guy. It's simp, uh, incompetent, or evil. Yeah, that's the only three. Um, role, yeah. In Ghostbusters 2016, yeah, John Snow, the, the, yeah. the idiot, the idiot uh, secretary dude in that. Um, Chris Hemsworth. It, uh, yeah, yeah. Or there's a bit in one of the, I think it is an episode of the Star Wars 7 or 8. There's one bit. I, I, I can't remember it properly. Maybe it's the death of Han Solo scene. But someone says, they say explicitly something like, and I'm paraphrasing, um, like history is dead. Or forget about uh, everything that's kill already the past. Yeah, kill, kill, Not kill the past. Kill the past. Sorry, that's it. That's it. That is yeah. sort of boiled down to its, to its essence, what they're trying to do. Everything you like. Everything you thought you liked about this universe and these characters, we're gonna we're gonna kill it. We're gonna fucking humiliate it first and then kill it. How about that? Yeah. I mean, they're pretty. It's pretty straight it, up. It's almost systematic. Like like just yeah, look right. at Indiana yeah. Jones recently. I, like if there is an old beloved franchise or character that they're gonna try and adapt or whatever you know what they're going to do and you can go through all from luke skywalker to indiana jones to wheel of time it's just so many things yeah, yeah. i feel like it's not they're not trying to be cool it's very just spite it's just spite well i think i i would uh, i'd be okay with it if like we we were saying there was a bit of variation there it's like okay imagine if we did uh the ahsoka show and like we're now picking up with ahsoka who is older and she's like embittered by the the failures that she's uh encountered uh and she's like maybe in the luke skywalker um camp where she's like like isolated and, and living alone and drinking green alien titty milk or whatever <laughs> god awful thing they have her doing uh something to break her down but like they won't because mm -hmm. I know they won't, because they couldn't possibly do that to a female character. She has to be oh. amazing at yeah. all times. Like they, that humiliation and deconstruction is reserved entirely for men. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just like once you've seen it about a dozen times, you start to get a little bit fucking tired of it. You know what I'm saying? They're running out. Yeah. Like, and yeah, they, they, they've <laughs> yeah they've done everything. Marty McFly. That's really <laughs> the only guy left. <laughs> And they're yeah. coming for him. They probably will, yeah. And, they are. His, yeah. his wife, his his mum will go back and sleep with a black guy. He goes, oh no, I'm half black. And he'll just do all that to make him the main character because he's too white to be the star. Marty comes out as trans. Yeah, they'll be doing that. But, uh, I changed your gender, Marty. I, honestly, I think if they were ever to re remake um, Back to the Future, like Marty would be a black uh, teenage girl. And she would go back yeah. to the 1950s and it would just oh, be a commentary on how, yes. how racist God, it right. was. Yeah, uh, you're, you're right. 100% right. oh, that's what they would do. Um, and I, I know they, they couldn't fucking help themselves. Like they, It would just be like every instinct in their body would be telling them they had to do it. Um, I just hope Robert Zemeckis, please never die. Just just live <laughs> forever so that you, nobody can get the rights to this this franchise because it's like one of the only ones that's left um well, i, I feel like i'll well, say you see like that medieval 
Sorry. No, no, go, go. I was going to say, you see it in medieval shows like The Witcher, The Wheel of Time, uh, what's the, Rings of Power. They all look the exact same, like an airport. Like, you just get people <laughs> from everywhere. Yeah. It's just it's ridiculous. The, again, you can take a scene from one of those shows and you just not know which show it's from. Yeah. I, I, uh. I the, the Witcher was, like, so fucking bad for that. Because oh, yeah. it was like, I... I Every scene that you're in, like when they set the the establishing shots in a, a village or like a town or whatever, and you just see like average civilians walking around, it could be anywhere. Like there's no consistent like look or feel to any place, uh, and it all like you know wherever you go, there's going to be a mix of like all different ethnicities, whatever uh, accents in, in that place. Yep, and it's like, it's like oh, okay, the 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 result is it's like I I've got no con no idea of the geography of this world because every place looks exactly like every other place. They all just look like fucking downtown LA mm -hmm. because that's all yep. the writers know and that's all they can project onto the the fantasy world that they've been given. You would and have a white British man and a, and he'd go, "I'm white British and this is my black American brother," and you're like, "No, he's not." <laughs> yeah, but that was literally <laughs> every show. Yeah, and the interesting exception to that is House of the Dragon, where the yep. outfits are done really well. There is like a, like a very purposeful, more traditional medieval aesthetic to a lot of the outfits. That but I was just thinking of, like you know, one of the outfits that uh, the sons were wearing. It was the one where he was going on the dragon to forge the alliance towards the end of the thing before there was a big chomp. But the outfit he was wearing was just absolutely gorgeous, and uh, and. Like if you were to give like a still screen and you you didn't know the characters or everything, you could still pick it out as being from that show because of how well they did on so many of just the sets and everything. And of well, the they, they even managed to work in a pretty good level of diversity with the Valerians by um by like making that part of the lore. Mm -hmm. It's like okay, yeah. like you've got these the, this sort of uh, sect within that uh, that that culture. Um, and this is this is how they operate, and it's like okay, fine, you've established those rules and you stick to them exactly in the context of the show. It's like perfect, that's that's mm -hmm. how you do it. And, and you they... don't pretend that you don't pretend that every fucking random village that you run into it like yeah. looks like like Reaper said, like a fucking airport where everyone's just from mm -hmm. everywhere. Like that's and not how people would operate. I was impressed with it, like like how they integrated it into the show actually enhanced the story with uh, what they did with the Valerians in there. And so it's all about execution. And if you can pull it off, absolutely well done, you know. Uh, yeah. But so often, Wheel of Time was just a joke in regards to that, where they may like. By the way, guys, season two is going to be out tomorrow. Out I'm tomorrow, raised, I watched the uh, first amazing. one. It was terrible. Uh, and so it. Just to finish what I was saying is um, the two rivers, uh, the books are very, di very clear about the kind of look at eth ethnicity, uh, my, my mouth, um, ethnicity of uh, the uh, areas and everything, and especially the two rivers. But in the show, the two rivers was more diverse than Tarvolan, which is this big multicultural city. And it's, uh, it's bonkers. What it's like. yep. And... Uh, um. But, uh, well, gentlemen, there's one other thing I was going to cover tonight, and that is, uh, I know you're all big fans of Captain Marvel. Like, we all are here, and we, yeah, we yeah. want to see it succeed. Um, but the, the future of the franchise is in doubt. <clears throat> and brace yourselves for this one, because this, uh, this came about uh, like a week or so ago, but uh, I wanted to cover it now because I've never had a chance to get onto it yet. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, Nia de Costa, the, the director of The Marvels, which is effectively Captain Marvel 2, um, said was, was talking about the prospects of uh, the, the franchise moving forward. Um, she said that uh, she had shared her future ideas with Marvel Studios head Kevin Feige. Uh, she re and apparently, according to her, she received a mixed reception from him, sometimes thinking that, hey, I've got a movie going. And other times feeling that there's a whole other plan that I'm not part of. Um, she also went on to say that in terms of women-led films and women as superheroes in particular and excitement around that, I think it's just about whether or not the movie's good, especially now that there are more and more action or superhero movies with female leads. And I just thought, oh... You're almost there. Um, <laughs> but like, if you're going to hang your hat on whether or not your movie's actually good 
uh, in terms of getting like future uh, future sequels. I'm not sure if Captain Marvel 2 is the way you want to go. <laughs> uh, it's not the hill I would want to die the on. That's not for sure. favoring you. No. What a crazy no. thought of trying to make trying to make it a good film or as good as possible. What a crazy. The I villain mean, has a grill. Well, well, he, you'll be pleased to know, right? Because it's going to be funny, right? She said the biggest difference between this and the other MCU MCU movies to date is that it's wacky and silly. Yay. The worlds that we go into in this movie are worlds unlike <laughs> others you've seen in the MCU. Bright worlds that you've never seen before. Uh, so hang on. So, the MCU hasn't been wacky or silly yet. And like, no, no, no. It's been serious. dire and serious. Like, yeah. you know. And I just, thought, was dark. I, I just thought, like, what balls on this woman to say, oh. like, well, the success of this franchise is going to depend on whether or not Captain Marvel 2 is good. Uh, it's wow. the quiet part out loud. She just said what we all knew. They just get hired because they're terrible and because they're women. Yeah. I just it think almost... what the, the, there's almost this uh, there's this slight hint of like reality starting to creep in where she's like, yeah, um, people are kind of over superhero movies now, and if anyone's going to watch them, it has to be really fucking good to attract people's attention. Um, it's almost like the next step is to say. My movie isn't it, <laughs> but she's not going to say that. No. <laughs> uh, you wonder sometimes oh. what planet they're on. These sort of, well, progressive for want of a better word. There's all sorts of words you could use. But so, what planet are they on? Like, what could they possibly be thinking? You know, she wants I, to I make th- it wacky. Uh, I, I are, think, you ju- uh... are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I, I think at this point it's just like we're we're throwing anything we've got against the wall. It's like what can you say to recommend yeah. your film uh, at this point? Like I don't know, it's wacky and funny, I guess. Sure, yeah, okay. <laughs> let's do that. Though they have nothing. They have absolutely yeah. nothing. Yeah, I mean, because like in the past you might have been able to say like, uh, well, it's got Brie Larson in it. Uh, she's a big star. Uh, Theoretically, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In 2023, uh, not so much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they yeah, put her. They... they put her with two diversity hires, haven't they? Miss Marvel and Monica Rambo, who look just as boring as she does. Yeah, I mean, I never understood what even she was um, because she she went into um, Wonder Vision, walked through a barrier like an energy barrier, and then just became a flimpy like uh, I can absorb energy kind of person. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, okay, make loads like, of fine. sense. That's what you are, and like then Ms. Marvel, like nobody in their right mind watched her show, so they don't even know what she is. Like, I don't know, could she make her fists really big so she can punch things extra hard? She's a it, knockoff it, Green Lantern. Like Marvel I, has I think been so, yeah. desperate to make Miss Marvel a thing for years. They have been yeah. pushing that character so much and failing almost like every single time no one is interested in this character and i actually gave miss marvel the tv show a go and i actually thought it wasn't the worst thing marvel had done i i've checked out it was i was not interested in it. it was a teen girl you know show made for teen girls um i thought the main actress was actually really charming and she did a great job but it, i was i checked out because i just wasn't interested no one was interested in it and you're right. Like th- these are the characters they're trying to attract people to the Marvels. Uh, it's not working. What happened, to, uh, what happened to the She-Hulk show? Did that, did that oh. die, die on its ass, or what happened? Are they, are, they, are they getting a season two? Because I heard rumors. I've only seen a headline. I don't know if it's true or not. Right. Uh, yeah, that is that's up there with Velma as like legit one of the most despised shows of like modern era. Um, here's a, here's another thing, and maybe I could be accused of being in sort of a, a in a re- very real sense an old school misogynist for saying what I'm about to say. But lots of women in the real world, actual real life women and girls, they don't want they don't aspire to be a massive hulking She Hulk type Miss Marvel. Super badass, hard enough. Well, I don't no, want to be that. So I, I think this, so what's this is the audience for it. Yeah, right? I, I think this is this is ties into like um, what we discussed 
previously about why Barbie was so successful because it was a movie that was unashamedly marketed to women. Where it's like, okay, it's very feminine, it's like bright colors, it's very pink, and like it's just, you know, you got Margot Robbie, she's not like an ass kicking like girl boss, she is a, a very feminine, uh, beautiful woman in that, that movie, and that's perhaps why it was so wildly successful. Um, the, the problem is that they've tried to bend uh, traditionally male franchises whether it's Star Wars, whether it's Star Trek, whether it's Marvel around women to try and make it appeal to them. And it hasn't worked because by and large, yeah, that's not their their um, interest. It's not their power fantasy of being like a big hulking, powerful superhero. <laughs> that's not yeah. what they're looking for. <clears throat> and it's not what they want to see in cinema. And so they, they, they've not gone to go and support it. And all they've done is alienate their traditionally male audience because they've straight up said, this isn't for you anymore. This is this is girl oriented. Yeah. Yeah, uh, like so women, they... well, women aping men, right? Most blokes uh, just find it stupid or absurd or laughable or something. Most women don't really uh, like it either. You know, I think it was it was you drink, or maybe it was as somebody said a long time ago. Again, about Ghostbusters 2016. You know how like Kate McKinnon stands, the way she holds herself in that her gait, like pretending to be a dude. Like no men actually stand like that. You know, it's a stupid, it's a stupid parody of a man. Like, and I, I see a, I see a bit of that in um, in some of the f f female characters in Ashoka. Um, you know, well, it's um, penis envy. Uh, it, it's just, it, it's, it's just like, well, it, it's like, yeah, the, there's an element perhaps in Ahsoka where they say, like, well, the traditionally uh, masculine heroes are super stoic, they're emotionally guarded, uh, they don't give much away, and so we're gonna ape that. But they, they do it to such a ridiculous extent that it becomes a parody. It's not like yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. it's, it's not, not believable, relatable. is it? Right, yeah. Well, yeah, still very much about execution because there are shows with, in fact, it was a cluster of them more late 90s, early 2000s, right? Because I was just thinking about Buffy and Alias and, uh, remember, well, someone with Jessica Alba was like Dark Angel or something. There are well, plenty of TV uh, shows yeah. about. Well, uh, the, 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 the example I cite is um, Aaron Soon from Farscape. Yeah, where it's Farscape. like you've got a very um, tough strong female character but like she also has moments of uh of emotional vulnerability that uh, make her relatable it's like they're not afraid to go into those those areas with the character and that's that's what makes them interested like you've got a, a a shield between them and the rest of the world but then you get to see the real person underneath it occasionally the classic um, example you've said before drinker is ripley from aliens like a, a true believable badass and sort of emotionally fragile and just all of those things and nobody hates her you you definitely empathize with ripley right so it can be done it can absolutely be done yeah i mean she worked so well because she was the voice of reason for she was the voice of the audience like you know for so much of the the first alien movie it's like no we, we shouldn't let this um fucking crew member who's got an alien parasite attached to his face into the ship like that's really dangerous we shouldn't do that you know, gets overruled, but like, and she gets scared and she gets, uh, you know, freaked out by stuff that happens because that's what the audience would feel. I she just say, because the... I fucking adore Alien. That that bit of writing is so good. Uh, that that would be normal in terms of a, a sort of precaution or a protocol in the future. It will be when someone gets hit by something on an alien planet, we don't let them on board. And so, why does he get on board? Because Ash lets him on board manually. Yeah. Why does Ash do that? Because he's under command from Wayland got... Corp to get that yeah. alien on board. So fucking but, good. You don't even get that at the time. You're like, why did that just happen? Like, yeah, mm. but like his his explanation for why he did it makes sense in in the context exactly, of yeah. like what you saw. Like that's what why it works on two levels, and it, it carries over into the second movie where she's like, um, you know, that. recognizes like, well, okay, if they, they these marines fire all their pulse rifles in this like highly um, dangerous reactor area, isn't it going to cause an overload and blow the place up? Oh shit, we never thought of that. But like she recognizes it, like again, she's just the voice of reason in all of this. She's not trying to make some feminist point about why women are better than men or anything. It's just like, no, I'm just a rational person, like using the the, the knowledge I have at my disposal um, to, to try and keep everyone from getting um, killed. 
And she's well, like, she leads, like, like, we get her. We're like, we, we totally empathize with her because she's us. Yeah. She's like a she legitimate leads. badass that can kill a queen alien. She's like more badass than, than Marines. But she's also a mother to Newt, basically, some sort of surrogate mother. And it works. She doesn't have to be a parody of a man in any way. Yeah. That seems to be a big thing that uh, modern writers are missing because – like when I'm writing characters, right? Of course, a big distinctive element of their character is their gender, male and female. And so when I'm writing a male character, what other male characteristics I'm going to give this character? And I'm going to make ones that are more emphasized and pronounced and other ones that are lesser. And same when, with female characters. What are this character's fe feminine characteristics if they're a woman? Because they should feel like a woman if it's if that's what they are. Where in these modern characters, Ahsoka is a great example. Like, what are Sabine's feminine characteristics? As like, can can we name any? I, I, she has a Karen haircut. <laughs> like, yeah, her bonnet. And, and and the contrast is stark when we compare someone like Ripley. And one of the more recent actual good examples is Alita Battle Angel. One of the reasons I love that movie is the character. She was great. And they allowed her to be distinctly feminine while also being a legitimate badass. And it was, I just love the film as a result. But modern writing writers, well, well, well I mean, well, oh, men and women, uh, you're saying they're different is problematic. And therefore writing them different would be problematic well, as well. Um, and, uh, well, one of the good uh, movies that I saw relatively recently was Fall. You know that that one about the two girls who climb up the to the top of a TV tower, um, and they they get stranded up there. The the ladder collapses behind them, and they're they're stuck at the the top of this thing, um, and they're just on this tiny little platform. They could fall off at any moment. The the main character in that is a deeply flawed character with uh, with all kinds of hang ups and traumas that she's dealing with. Um, but you absolutely get behind her because you can understand where she's coming from because she's an empathetic, well-written character. Again, that's just the... It's not difficult necessarily. It's just like you have to be willing to let your characters have a little bit of vulnerability and a little bit of, uh, you know, flaws and human frailties. Well, who's Once writing you do them? that, the audience is going to empathize with them. It's just human I'll nature. Say Who's writing them now? Because Dave Filoni's a male feminist and he's writing right. Ahsoka. And most of the other people are 30, 40-year-old women who have made mistakes. And instead of going, oh, I need to examine my life, I'm just going to write horrible versions of myself. <laughs> in all the <laughs> That's why these are women. Because the women writing them and the male feminists are just bitter, angry people. I mean, you're yeah, right. A, a good example I thought of is um, one of the best films I've seen in the last few years was June. Um, and uh, I, I, well, I love the original novel, the original, the first Frank Herbert June and the character of Jessica, you know, Paul's mother. Um, it, that's a, a, a good, strong female character that isn't trying to be a man, isn't trying to, you know, beat people up or shoot loads of people or be a soldier or stand like like a, a man stands or anything like that. And yet she's genuinely really strong and really, um, well, I, I think I think she's a great character. Uh, I mean, it carries over like from, that? yeah, when that carries over from the books when the, the Bene Gesserit are like this um, order of, uh, what would you even describe them as? They're like kind of com a combination of like prostitutes Illuminati. and assassins. Yeah, like the, they're also they like a of, religious order, aren't they? The Benedictine they religion. they're all of those things. Yeah, like they basically do subterfuge. They they manipulate events behind the scenes, and they get people into um, positions of power or next to people who are in positions of power so that they can influence them. But like they they are the the book is smart enough to portray them as they don't uh, prevail through like force of arms. They're they're not. Uh, they're not powerful warriors necessarily. Like they're more subtle than that. They're they're spies. They um, get th to people through, um, you know, uh, manipulation. Well, they have rather kids. than just overt force. Yeah, like they, it could be anything. Like they're concubines. That that's how they, <laughs> they do these things. Um, and that's a, that's an interesting thing to play with with your female characters. Like you you don't have to make them warriors who swing axes into people's faces, and they're just as physically imposing as men like they 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 can be more subtle than that uh and that's that's what 
I suspect they might lose gradually with the, the, the Dune movies because they won't want to portray them that way. They have to portray them as being the equal of men physically. Of Doesn't course they Paul do. have like Paul has like a mistress and he marries other people and it's like, are you really gonna have him like just treating women like that? It's not gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't yeah. I don't I don't think they would go down that road. Um it would no, just she'll be get like he'll a... get dumped and he'll just start crying, listen to Nickelback or something, and then he'll go <laughs> and get married to another girl. <laughs> Because that first right. movie was really faithful to the novel, like yeah. really, really, really faithful for once. So I wonder was, what yeah. they're going to do. I wonder, yeah, where they're going to go with it. Because Paul is a, a complicated character, isn't he? Um, well, I, I think, yeah, this is what might not translate into the movie quite so well. Is like Paul's not necessarily a character that you're meant to cheer for, especially right. when you see what he becomes. Yeah. Mm. It's like it's a the whole point of it. It's like a cautionary tale about the the allure of power and um, what it does to a person once they once they win their battle, you know. Because Paul doesn't necessarily become a good person, and he makes a lot of bad decisions along the way, and a lot of people suffer because of what he does. I don't know if they'll they'll be able to convey that in the film, or like if they do, I don't know if audiences will get it. But they already changed stuff. Like they didn't call it a um, a jihad; they call it a crusade. And like they've race swapped one or two characters, so you can see it creeping in all these little changes. And you see whether yeah. or not that affects the second or third film coming out. Yeah, mm. I mean it's going to be years before the next one comes out anyway, because it's now been delayed until twenty twenty four, I think. For so now. there's only the marbles. <laughs> yeah, that that's it. That's what it would have been fun. To forward to. to have the Marvels versus Dune two. That would have been cool. But oh well, <laughs> yeah. competing yeah. for uh, IMAX screens. But now the Marvels gets to enjoy all the IMAX screens. Go nuts! I'm sure everyone I'm will sure, take advantage of that. Yeah, I'm sure it's really going to help them. Uh, well, we had Barbie and Oppenheimer, and well, apparently Oppenheimer beat Barbie today for the first time ever in the global like daily box office. So Oppenheimer they... had legs, didn't it? I mean, yeah, like what was that a month ago that it came out? Yeah, so uh, it worked out. Good for you, Nolan. Good for you. Were they, well, were they talking about it breaking a billion potentially by the time it's done? Yeah, and and it's uh it's it's only got Joker to defeat now for highest uh, box office for an R-rated film of all time. Let's oh, see where cool. it's sitting right now. Uh, okay. So, Which I want the Bob and Hannah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hmm, it's sitting at 788 million right now. So that's got a ways to go if it's going to reach a billion. Like, I don't know how much long, longer its theatrical run is going to be. Um, potentially because there's nothing else that's going to come out. <laughs> like, maybe it'll just be still showing this time next year. Who knows? So, how's Blue Beetle going? Oh, it's making uh, all the money. Back. It's so popular. That, that, that's it. coming out on streaming already, isn't it? Dude, that one. <laughs> Among many is the one where people are like, "What the fuck are you doing, DC fans? You all talk, you gas up all these movies, talk about how great they are online, and then you don't come into the fucking theaters to watch them. What's okay. going on? Are you ready to have your socks blown right off your feet? So, um, yeah, Blue Beetle worldwide box office eighty three point six million. Wow! <laughs> how much was the budget? Uh, about two hundred and no, sorry, one hundred and fifty million. That they admit to is probably oh. realistically, and I'll say this is probably more like 200 million plus advertising. Yeah, if you do can the I, marketing on top of that, can oh. I ask you guys when was the last time you went to the cinema? Do you go to the cinema often? Because I haven't been to the cinema in ages, and I mean like five, six, seven years. I can't really remember the last time I went to the cinema. I, I went to the last time I saw went to the cinema was a few weeks ago. I went and saw Gran Turismo. And that was because it was a free screening because I've got an Odeon fucking membership yeah, thing. Um, that was it. Hmm. Uh, sometimes, like you know, sometimes, yar, me. Yeah. You know? I mean, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I mean, I go far more often. Than... Jack Sparrow loads of times. He's great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I go far more often because I try to review films. If I wasn't reviewing them, they're so I wouldn't have watched Blue Beetle. I wouldn't have given a stuff about a Flash. Like so many, I, I definitely wouldn't have seen Barbie. Like uh, so many films, I just would not give a crap about and wouldn't have gone to see. I just put a, co a bootleg copy on my videos. You can see the spotlights just flying around the screen. 
<laughs> I guess ask the wrong group of people that are professional movie reviewers. <laughs> the answer's yeah. going to be, yeah, we go all the time. What are you I mean, about? it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Like every movie that I review, I totally go to the cinema and, and watch it. Sometimes I even travel to America when it's not being released in the UK yeah. because or India. I, would not, I would not dream <laughs> of uh, circumventing, you know, worldwide copyright. Uh, yeah, that's the lengths we go to. <laughs> Funny thing. That's how I was able to see the Blue Beetle because it wasn't getting released in Australia for like a mu another month or so. But I was in the UK and it was out. And it's like, oh, I can actually watch this for, you know, the FNT review. So, yeah, know, catching it. Um, what do you reckon, gents? Should we do a few super chats? See what yeah. people have got to say to us this evening? All right. I'll do it. So, uh, RRTNZ says, Hail Drinker, great to see you still regularly supporting smaller channels. Nice one, mate. Chuck Norris would approve, which is good because he can punch you so hard that you'll bleed someone else's blood. That's true, actually, and I'm terrified mm. of Chuck Norris, so yeah. I'm yeah, I've heard, him. I've heard when Chuck Norris does push-ups, he actually doesn't lift himself. He's just pushing the earth away from him, yeah. so they say. <laughs> I heard he once went to visit the Virgin Islands. Now they're just called the islands <laughs> uh, terrified says uh, drinker i heard you like sabaton which is your favorite song or band from that uh, genre it would probably be bismarck i fucking love that song that's great uh, it's great when they're on stage performing it as well because they've got like uh, amazing graphics going on and they've got a tank on stage that they just occasionally it'll fire its gun which is awesome um <laughs> so uh, i love the last stand from sabaton that's oh, that, oh yeah that song yeah. goes so hard man i freaking love it yeah ghost division is another good one uh yeah glippy says drinker were you in a limmy skit a few years ago yes i was <laughs> it's the jogging one um yeah if you know it you'll see it uh but yeah i'm there i got to lift limmy up at the end as well um yeah in celebration so that was good fun actually i like that um kelly fall says drinker you must watch the last voyage of the demeter it's much better than it has any right to be easily eight and a half out of ten in my opinion yeah i'm gonna watch that actually um it's on my it's on my list um i'm i can't say i'm gonna go all the way to the cinema to watch it yar matey but uh i will i will give it a watch and if it's good i'll give it a review um Scott Lawrence gave us 20 Australian dollars. What are they? What, is, what does that equate to? I don't even know what that is. Chad, help me oh, out. A couple of cents, maybe. Uh, yeah. if, if you want pounds, it's even Pence, worse. not cents. Yeah. You heathen. Um, Gopher Broke says, which book series is better than Lord of the Rings or Wheel of Time? Well, in Lord of the Rings case, nothing. It's the best. I don't know if anyone else has got any suggestions. I mean, look, I love all of Brandon Sanderson's work. So, you know, Mistborn, Stormlight Archives and stuff. I, I was, I would, of course, have said Wheel of Time, but they said excluding Wheel of Time because Wheel of Time is amazing. Um, yeah. Well, the first three uh, June books are good. They are very good. Um, Callum Dimmick here says, Shad, if you're interested in We Have Castles in America. No, you don't. You've got little <laughs> <sports and stuff. laughs> You have little sand castles, Fuck baby. off. You don't have castles. <laughs> If it's less than 500 years old, I don't want to hear about it. Uh, specifically in Ohio, some rich folks bought some German castles and moved them here brick by brick yeah. across the ocean. That's them. like when they bought London Bridge and they thought yeah. it was Tower Bridge, but it was actually just a shitty London Bridge <laughs> and got shipped over to America. You didn't get the real one. You can't buy culture, I'm afraid. So Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> weird. You buy a whole castle and move it over. I mean, I... I, I'd, I'd I'd do it. I'd do it. Yeah, I could see what <laughs> if I could. We all know you do it. <laughs> um, Scott Lawrence says, "Drinker, how has fame affected you? Do you need to be more careful about what you say, or how you, sp or do you just speak freely?" I'm not famous. I'm yeah, holy crap! Saying. Am I in the presence of someone famous? Oh my gosh! This is. I, this I, is I was shocked to my core when like an Amazon delivery driver like recognized who I was. That was about it. Like I'm not uh, I'm not a celebrity. Uh, well, he also sorry. I was just saying. In truth, though, the thing is, I mean, this is the new media, right? And uh, uh, like, it, you are becoming the new celebrity these days. Uh, but you know, your channel's no, going you, great. 
You may yeah. not be Brad Pitt level famous, but you're, yeah. you're not normal person level famous. <laughs> so. <laughs> I I think if there was anything, I, I guess you're sometimes aware of like, oh, like if I'm ranting away about something on a live stream, could someone clip that? Could they, they take that out of context? I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe that's probably like... the only thing. It's not like the olden days, like Frank Sinatra, where everyone would know who you are if you're famous. But if you've got over a million subs and you're knocking nearly two now, right, um, there will be a percentage of people that know who you are, right? I mean, in the yeah. whole population, I mean. Uh, so it's fair enough to say you're certainly internet famous. Well, it's always, it's always fun when you go to like a convention because it's a little ego boost and you can pretend you're like you're a big shot for a day or two um, <laughs> because like you're surrounded by people who know you because they've obviously come there to meet you and say hello and stuff and like that's cool but then you just go back to your regular life and it's like ah oh, i'm just uh, i'm no one again <laughs> that's great See, that is actually the good type of youtube fame it is exactly that is that you get the moments where you get to interact with the fans. Uh, I went to a medieval festival, and so we had a meet and greet. There was a heap of fans there, and that was awesome. And then, uh, and then you also get to just be a normal person uh, outside of it. Yeah, and that, that's kind of what you want because, like, you, mm -hmm. I don't know, like being, say, some famous actor or something like that, or, or big musician, whatever. Um, you know, just not being able to walk down the street without people like seeing you and like being like, oh, I want to get my picture or whatever. Like, oh, <laughs> that, that just seems like Sorry. really tough going. I don't know. Jerika, have you ever, ever had someone just stare at you, right? And you don't know if it's because they recognize you or they just think you look really dumb or something like that. And you're wondering, there, like, there should I say <laughs> hi or just wave or? <laughs> there's a little bit of that, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's all kinds of weird stuff like you know maybe at a convention like someone will just like stand near your table for ages looking at you but not actually come and say hello yeah. <laughs> I was like oh you make me feel uncomfortable now <laughs> uh, also from Scott Lawrence says uh, the word hero gets thrown around a lot these days but how would you describe your contribution to the world of critics I assume you mean movie criticism um, I guess it depends who you ask like uh if you ask a fan, they would say like, "Yeah, he's like the voice of uh, like regular people who just watch movies." Uh, if you watch like uh, a critic, um, they'd be like, "No, this guy's literally the worst thing that's ever happened to movie criticism ever. He's a blight on it." <laughs> yeah, so, they do. They do say they that. Wa they walk out of Star Wars, but Ahsoka merch going, "Don't listen to him." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. So uh, yeah. Like for myself, I'm just like, oh, just give my opinion on things. That's all I do. Um, and sometimes people listen to me, sometimes they don't. That's just, uh, that's all you can do, I suppose. Um, Elsie Le Pen says, uh, cheers, gents. Uh, Mauler, congrats on a great 24 hour EFAP. Thank you very much. It was tough, but we pulled it off. Um, drinker, that Kerry Hoskins picture made my jaw drop. 25 years and she's still got it. Yeah, that was the Sonya Blade um, motion capture girl. Her. Holy fuck, man. She, yeah. uh, she aged well. I'll say that. She stayed in shape. Any <laughs> woman, think... any woman who's like 50 odd years old and still got a six pack. In fact, fuck it. Any girl ever who's got a six pack. You got my respect. Well done. So Salma Hayek has got the, uh, we saw recently on, um, oh, what's it called? Charlie Brooker. Um, what, what's Black it Mirror? Again? Yeah, Black Mirror. What? She's on oh, Black right. Mirror. Have you seen a picture of her? No. Oh, she she's still got her. She's like 60 odd. Oh, yeah. Selma Hayek. Like, she's just yeah. aged like fine wine. It's just awesome. And then you compare it to Madonna and you're like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it was when um, I was reviewing The Eternals, right? And it's like, you've got Angelina Jolie and Selma Hayek, like two women who were like top of their game, like in their, their prime. But like Angelina Jolie is 10 years younger than Selma Hayek. But holy shit, like she looks 10 years older than her. You know, that's that's how they've aged in relative terms. You know, Selma Hayek just looks amazing. There is, Julie, uh, uh, there is something sorry. remarkable about Selma Hayek. I saw her on Twitter, it was like Selma Hayek through the years, from like the 80s or 90s anyway, through to now. And she looks pretty much the same. It's quite remarkable, yeah. really. Just, uh, yeah. I don't know. Good good genetics, I suppose. Um, 
Cirrhosis of Liver says, what is each member of the panel's favorite Mel Brooks movie? Additionally, whenever, uh, sorry, whatever happened to slapstick comedy? Did society forget how to laugh? I don't know. I missed the airplane movies. That's for sure. Spice um, Bowls is... Spice Bowls I like Spice Bowls. So, yeah. Men in yeah. Tides. I love Men in Tides. <laughs> Blazing Saddles. Bla oh, God, yeah. I forgot Blazing God, Saddles. Yeah. It's, is he uh, in the producers? Yeah. Is is that is he is that one of his films? The producers. Uh, I remember. That's quite, that's quite funny. But yeah, Blazing Saddles. I changed I think my answer. Frankenstein art. probably deserves a uh, mention as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, fair play. I think. Um, and Robin Hood Men in Tights was really good when I think about it now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that or Blazing Saddles, I think would get my vote for sure. Um, Jeff Romadix says, funny how Disney threw out the expanded universe when acquiring Star Wars, and yet the Ahsoka show is trying to be heir to the Empire, the greatest EU book ever written. They uh, should have just let with that for the sequels. I think what they're saying is they should have just gone with that for the sequels. Yeah, well, Han and Leia are dead. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, dead. one big problem. Arguably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they have to pay any royalties to the author that wrote the like who created Thrawn, like the original character. Because if they're using that Zorn, character, right? yeah, he would have to get some level of royalties, you'd think, if they're even using that character. Because one of the reasons it really looks like Disney got rid of the expanded universe was so that they didn't have to pay people royalties if they're using those stories. And it was a, obviously a dumb move because what was written there is a thousand times better than what Disney tried to crap out. Um, so it was just a result of greed, and then they're losing more money as a result anyway. So they get what they deserve. Yep. Um, David Lamplow says, It annoys me the credit that people used to give Dave Filoni, and yet all of his products are stolen or borrowed content from the EU, including the old Clone Wars series, uh, but selecting the stories that they want. He messed with Mandalorian lore, which actually mostly came from the old Republic video game. The only content that he made really is rebels but even then uh it needs to carry carry it with the old eu characters i.e thrawn well i have to take your word for that one i guess yeah. like i'm not an expert on it but yeah I, I i could believe what you're saying there for sure am i right in thinking that those novels were written in sort of the very early 90s and so uh... i don't know if you guys can fill me in on this but at what point did Hold george on. lucas sort of just let people Right, it's before the prequels. Well, I know that. I mean, so, they were making yeah, expanded universe content for a while there. Uh, from my understanding, is George was only very strict about the uh, Skywalker saga. No one's allowed to write, you know, or if you know, like the core films are his thing. Um, but there was a lot of freedom to expand on things before and after. Yeah, the, uh, yeah so the old Republic's to, like three thought. Sorry. Yeah, Heir to the Empire, I think, was the early nineties. That it came out, just for reference. That's the no that's the novel or the novels. That yes. It, that this right, yeah. Nineteen ninety one, nineteen ninety two uh, was the sort of period that it came out. So, like, Return of the Jedi comes out in what, like, eighty three? Is it? I think. So, yeah. so there's a whole period there where I guess I don't know. I'm guessing here that George Lucas was like, no one can. I don't really want people to be doing much and I'm not going to sort of allow it to be canon. But at some point in the early 90s, he's, he's said, OK, go on then. I, I think, uh, I yeah, know. that sort okay. of period, I, I think the EU started to come about from the late 80s onwards. Correct me if I'm wrong on that one, but like, that's when it started to flourish. And particularly once you get to the early 90s, like, you know, the video games started to come out and it just, uh, it really took off from there. Um, and then he towards the end of the the 90s that's when he was really um gearing up for the the prequels um and that's when you got a lot more you know officially licensed works so phantom menace comes out in is it 1999 or the year 2000 99 yeah no, 99 right so that that project obviously would have been greenlit fairly long before that a year or two at least i would have thought uh, before that well, i think what he did was he he did the um remade versions of the original trilogy didn't he yeah so like yeah. i think 97 i think they started doing them where got those like, on VHS. Uh, yeah so like he'd been working on them um 
from the the sort of mid nineties onwards to to get them ready, and um, yeah, then it was moving into prequel territory. So when did he actually? Just one last thing on that. When did he actually sell? He, he sold Lucasfilm to Disney, right? So twenty is that right? That wasn't till yeah. then, right? Yeah, that's interesting, is it? If you bear that in mind, I, I think that's uh, interesting, isn't it? What, is that... Yeah, what a strange world we'd be living in now if he'd never sold it, because oh. I don't think he he would really got around to making the sequel trilogy, would he? So uh, didn't he call them white not, slavers? Yeah. yeah, and he's he's not wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think. Um, like whatever the flaws of the prequels, like I could have probably lived in a world where like he never did the sequel trilogy and he just uh you know, you got the, the big expanded universe of stuff, video games, books, all that stuff. Uh and that was it. I, I could have lived with Return of the Jedi being the, the end of the Star Wars story mm. as far as we were concerned, and that would have been okay with me. Mm. But no. Um Taker610 said, the Empire dude from Solo just happened to be on Starkiller base when Han uh, got killed in Force Awakens and renamed him Han Holo. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. Uh, Normie said, hello, I'm a big fan of all of you and your videos. What edi editing program would you recommend to new YouTubers, specifically one that allows you to add clips from movies or TV shows? Thanks. Oh, I don't know. I've always used Premiere, but, but because you have to pay for it, unless you can Premier sell on the Pro high seas. Premiere Pro is too fucking for complicated. I hate it. Actually, oh wait, no, DaVinci is. You, there's a free version to DaVinci. Uh, get a hold of that and get started on it, and learn that because if you can learn DaVinci, that's becoming the new standard in editing software at the moment. So, yeah. is it? Wow. Uh, okay. I've always I used use... Premiere Pro for everything. Well, it's funny. I, I'm. I still use Premiere Pro, but the guys working for me in the studio are all on DaVinci and they just say it's way better. Uh, that's but that's the main one that we're using. I'm just too old to change at the moment, but DaVinci is legitimately better from all reports at the moment. Uh, I use VideoPad Professional because it's a really simple timeline-based editing tool and, uh, well, kind of for the same reason that you use yours. Like, I just have grown up on it with youtube and i know how to use it so i kind of stuck with that i guess i use vegas because um, i'm familiar with vegas <laughs> there you go yeah um uh, kung fu hot dog says drinker i must say after seeing you at anime matsuri how big you are <laughs> well <you know. laughs> mm. i hope i was able to fit you in uh very <laughs> imposing shoulders of steel i'm guessing alcohol is the secret that's it you know, i just live on a diet of alcohol and red meat and that's uh that keeps me going i guess um yeah it's weird the amount of people like when i was like sat at my table and then i go to greet them and i stood up and they're like holy shit you're a lot taller than i expected it's like i don't know but people seem to think i'm really small for some reason <laughs> maybe it's just a camera like pointing down at me <laughs> How tall are you? Uh, six foot two. Oh, yep. So, yeah. <laughs> Taller yeah. than me. But it's weird. People think I'm short as well. And when they meet me in person, they're like, oh, you're taller than I thought. And it's like, oh, well, don't what know are, what are you? Oh, it's quite I'm, awesome, little, though, I'm just yeah. a little under six foot. And so, no, I'm right, so uh, um, still pretty fucking tall. At oh, Lotus like Eaters, sure. we get quite a lot of guests in, loads of people, really. And it's, it, quite a lot of the time, people aren't the size you think they are, both taller and smaller. You're like, oh, well, actually, he's tiny. I thought he was tall and he's not. Or completely the other way around. I thought he was nothing special and he's actually six foot five. Gary it's, surprising is... how often, it's surprising how often that happens, to be quite honest. Gary's taller than I expected. I, I thought he was quite short, but uh, yeah, he's he's pretty much my height. Uh, maybe like an inch shorter or something. Like, But yeah, um, no. Uh, Not a tall between the lengths. I'm six four. Well, yeah, I I should damn well hope so, long man. If you no, were man. tall, I don't know what I was doing. He's a tall man. Life. Imagine yeah. I was like four foot. Three. I know. Like, <laughs> I, I would feel betrayed. I was. You're like, wise instead. Are are you, are you actually six four? Like, yeah. Legit. Yep. Oh shit! You're taller than me. Got that. And by the way, Fringy is six five. Oh shit! <laughs> I was gonna say a lot of tall boys. I, I got me. Did you, you all meet there? in a tall club? Yeah, I well, <laughs> minimum height of well, fat must be six foot to like right. 
Uh, rags should be damn short. Like if, it's, if rags isn't short, I will feel betrayed. I think he's five ten. So okay, good. Makes Midget, sense. of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, that's I pretty mean, cool. Still tall for I'm a only dog, six foot. Marcus. Oh, you're a short arse then in this co- this. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> six foot flat is a bit taller than me. So there you go. Uh, yeah, no, we need to meet up and like compare heights or something. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Fix shoes I, I'll wear. Yeah, let, let's yeah. Really, yeah, that's that's all we'll be comparing. Built I'll be on. <laughs> yeah. Waylon Bersefus said, uh, would you rather be a rom- sorry, would you rather be a romantic who desperately wants to be a cynic or a cynic who desperately wants to be a romantic? I'm gonna go for the first one. I feel like if you're a romantic and you want to be cynical, like but you're still a romantic at heart. You're probably gonna have a happier life. I think if you're cynic, if you're cynical, and you want to be romantic. You're an incel. That's basically it. Huh? Can't get well, a girl. It's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, yeah, but being cynical, cynical yeah. but wanting to be romantic. It's like dreaming of being something better, but never being able to reach it. Whereas, I suppose, like, yeah. I don't know, being a romantic but wanting to be cynical. It's like I want to be more. Um, yeah, I, like, it's like I want to be worse than I am, but I, <laughs> I can't help it. I'm just so fucking good. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it sound me good because there's a good side and bad side to both. I mean, yes, it's good to be romantic, but it's it's not good to be so romantic that you're naive, and Stalker. it's good to be skeptical about certain things, so to have a level of cynicism. But you don't want to be so cynical that you don't give anything a chance. And so, balance. Find, find a balance in it. Yeah. Um, Indeed. Uh, Blankface says this money can be exchanged for goods and services. Excellent. And I will exchange that for goods in the form of alcohol. Um, <laughs> Kedge <laughs> says, love that you got Neil Marshall for an EFAP movie of Descent. And I doubt this will happen, but I would love if you guys could get Peter Jackson to talk about Lord of the Drink trilogy. <laughs> yeah, we'd all fucking love that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll just call him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's always he's always like you know like pounding on my door, like come on, I drinker, mean, like let me on. It makes me wonder though. I mean, because like yeah, yeah. So Hollywood directors, they're just people. I you know I don't put them up on a pedestal. Can we be sure, Shad? Can we be sure? Well, they're... you're right. Some do look pretty soulless. That's they true. wear people. They they exactly <laughs> just wearing, <laughs> wearing skin suits. Um, but like yeah. yeah, yeah You'd think that they'd be willing to just chat with people and with online media media growing and becoming far more legitimate and stuff like that. Because it's even to the point where the people in Hollywood are trying to mimic us and failing dramatically. Did you see the uh, the talk show host oh, guys? Oh. The oh. That was that was like nuclear levels of cringe right there. I, I oh my know. god, Try, trying to pretend to be normal people. That was so cringy. Yeah. I, I, like legitimately, are they, are they, each one of them looks like they search through their house to find the plainest, most normy section of their house, so they don't look like they're mega. Oh rich come on, Chad! Those are all volume screens. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, hide the champagne hot tub. Yes. <laughs> Get the and, children out of here. It's just so. It's, it's very likely a well. set. They're very likely yes. filming on a set. That's how sad it is. Oh. And they're, they're so desperate to try and mimic authenticity, like what we're doing naturally, and they're failing dramatically at it. It's like, guys, this mm-hmm. you're trying to enter our world now, and you have no idea. You guys are lost. Yeah, it's like because <laughs> you look at their uh, you look at their social media followings, and it's like ten million, five million, seven million, whatever. Uh, and then like the number of viewers that they've got for this uh, for this podcast that they're doing, it's like five thousand. Like, mm-hmm. good Man. lord, Man. how do you get such bad numbers? Like, drinker, I don't think it is that crazy that you could get some real A list uh, guests. This, like, the, your numbers are pretty spectacular, you know. Yeah, yeah it's a lot better than these much. jokers. Some of these guys, it, it would be great exposure, even for actual Hollywood A listers, some of them, like real directors and stuff. It's, it's well, not out of the realm of possibility. Well, Look at us right now. Like we're talking, you know, just bantering away. There's ten thousand people watching us live right now. Yeah, you're weird. That's more no, no, than these angry. these chumps are getting, like in their entire like live stream, and they're like famous celebrities in Hollywood. 
Oh, it goes to show you that they've been inflated artificially so much Mm. by being propped up by their network and relying on their writers. Like, if they legitimately had to enter into uh, a contest of pure talent resting on their own merits, right? Yeah, let's see how far they go, whether it's just them and a screen and an audience and nothing else. Oh, they, they, they're already falling flat on their face because the reality is most of these guys, they're not actually that talented apart from reading a script, right? They're, they're actors, essentially. They're, they're not authentic individuals. And that's how you succeed in this medium is you connect with the audience, you be yourself, and you're able to speak well. All those things need to be combined. And so seeing them just so desperate to fake it is just hilarious. Yeah, they're not it's funny just, or funny charismatic one. or quick or anything. It's, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, well, yeah. it's like it's watching them try to be normal. It's like watching these fucking pampered celebrities being like hey what up fellow normies i'm just like one of you uh and it's just yeah it's so fake and it's so sad to watch um uh, but yeah jj says get emily blunt sure uh, emily if you're watching give me a call we'll talk <laughs> come on emma you know if you want to makes... come on here sure yeah I'll, uh, I'll, 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 i do suspect that there's a number of people in hollywood that are not fallen down the activist bandwagon but just have had to shut their mouths to get by i suspect there's a good number of them that watch you and perhaps watch us as well and they just uh, stay in in the background there you know they might See, even be listening exactly. now get, I, I tell you i would uh i would do what it takes to get Hayley Atwell on here. I what think that would be an excellent stream. <laughs> like, give me one million dollars and you're like, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> but you have get to wear touch, a Hayley. bathing suit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the we'll term. make our money back within minutes, I guarantee it. <laughs> um, Waylon Bersefis says, is this the worst thing you can hear during a prostate exam? Look, ma, no hands. I mean, yeah, probably. Oh. I think so. Yeah. Uh... Uh, Kedge64 says, and here's a question for everyone. Who is your least favorite character from the Lord of the Rings movies? Hmm. Least favorite. And um, you can't just say like Sauron or something. like you know. That Denator guy, is that the character's name? Wait, are we picking yeah. the Tom like, Stewart? Characters that are typically liked. Is that the idea? I, I mean, guess it's a you know, tricky question because asshole characters. E- well, the evil characters are serving their role so well in the story that I'm reluctant to pick them because they're done so well. And if and like you're you're meant to hate Worm Tongue, yeah, and that, that that's the whole point behind the character. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm trying to think of a character that it actually lessens or makes the scene worse for being in it. And it's yeah, it's the least impactful fucking, character, really. Fucking Pippin. <laughs> he just does nothing but screw things yeah. up. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you, sir? Fool of a took. <laughs> I never really, really warmed to Sam. Samwise. Wow. Seems like a there's bit, there's controversial tongue-y. takes, and then there's that. <laughs> that is well, next level. And I'm assuming we're not allowed to pick anyone from the Hobbit series because that's no, a much easier. I'll allow it. <laughs> uh, uh, Thaden's nephew. What's his name? AMA. Wow, oh, okay. You don't like I'd him? say because he's the least impactful, but he's still good. Yeah, I mean, sure, I think that's a fair pick. Um, I can see people picking Legolas. He's not got a lot going on. Yeah, he becomes a, yeah, a Legolas. He becomes a bit of it's a cool, overpowered character at times. A um, little bit. A little bit. Well, he didn't run on a sword, did he? To fight a frost troll. No, but you know, he, he did like ride all over a olive font and slide down its trunk after owning it. And oh, stuff. we've all done that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> can't can't deprive the man of a little flourish at the, the moment of victory. Um, Does no one else think that sometimes Sam is a bit annoying? Is it just? Is it really just me? No, I would buy it for Frodo, but I'll Sam. Sam's pretty legendary no. throughout. <laughs> I mean, like, Sam, you Sam know, that, that line where it's like, I can't carry the ring, but I can carry you. It's like, oh, that gets that gets me right in the feels. I, I, or think, speak the, the the that, I, I think the thing that appeals to, to most people about Sam is that he's not like the, the classically heroic character. He doesn't have aspirations to do great things. He's just kind of 
He's a good man. Thrust into this situation, but like, by God, he rises to the occasion. Uh, well, Farmy says this. Well, Farmy goes, "Ooh, you is Butler." And he goes, "Is Gardner?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so fucking cool. Yeah, he's like, "Are you his bodyguard?" I'm like, no, it's Gardner. That, that's he a makes saying, line. "I'm his Gardner," pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wayland Bicephus says, "Imagine losing a war to a flightless bird." Hey, hey, hey! So if you fight that right. war yourself, you can't speak right. on it. Okay. <laughs> yes, that and the war has never been finished. Okay, it's not over. Oh, We're is this still the fighting EQ it. thing? Yeah, it's it's yeah, yeah. absolutely the thing. See, I, I we could, didn't I we could... didn't lose the war. We just haven't. It hasn't ended. We're still fighting it to this day, and we will destroy the emu menace. Thank you very much. I could I could get like losing a battle to um, um, kangaroos because they're hard as fucking nails. Like when you start punching them, like they just punch right back. Yeah, but emus can be tough. No, oh, hang on, you, is that from hang, experience? Trinka, have you fought an emu? Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm... Well, I, I like I punched a bunch of things that I thought were kangaroos, but it turned out they were like people. Hence, they don't live in the restraining orders that I got. <laughs> Emus are bloodthirsty psychopaths. You do like you do you yeah, you just gotta watch yourself with those the guys. What do you ever do see a kangaroo yet? rock back on its tail and kick with both legs? That could rip your guts out. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're hench as well. Like they're they're fucking ripped. Those yeah. they, they are. I'm they you are. guys have all seen that video where the guy squares up to one to save his dog, yeah. I think. And it's yeah. like flexing yeah, it just, chins, it's just, like, <laughs> it just yeah. takes it on the chin and doesn't yeah. even flinch. Yeah. <laughs> It's like animals, because animals the, the be way they literally just move around is extremely physically intensive. They're just jumping everywhere, which like if, if you've ever eaten kangaroo, right? The meat is insanely lean. There's like no fat in it at all. And it's real gamey and stuff because it's the type of animal that they are. They're a very physical animal. Don't the I mean, uh, drowns them. people? They're like killers, aren't they? they? They usually drown like animals and they walk out into a river and just hold you down. That what, mean? Kangaroos? That's terrifying. Yeah, can I, I watched the video, uh, Real Science, and he goes, they'll just pull you because they got a tail, they'll use a stabilizer and they'll try and goad you to come in and then they'll drown you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like it's like a like serial killer. It's like, <laughs> it's like a serial killer. has gone, who's killing all these people? It's like I, I rocked up here thinking I was going to have a, a good old fashioned fist fight, and then suddenly this thing's trying to drown me. <laughs> like, damn, I wasn't prepared for this. Shit. Um, Dark Hour says uh, To think this time last year I was prepping for happy hour, and Saturday Drinker is going to appear on my channel. It's crazy how the world works sometimes. Yeah, so on Saturday I'm going to be on um, Dark Hour's channel, and we're going to be talking about Total Recall. It's almost hey. like a happy hour, but like uh, on someone else's channel. You're gonna get Ash. your ass to Mars. <laughs> get your ass to Mars. Uh, yeah, it's the British version. Just... Get your ass to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> get ready for a surprise. It's that bit where this? he has to pull that fucking like tracking thing out of yeah. his nose. Mm. Oh god. Or is this yeah. the uh, Brian Cranston one? Ew! No one talks about that one. Not, gonna, not gonna mention that one. No, let's not talk about that one. <laughs> it doesn't exist. That didn't happen. Um, Shan Wickrasing says in Sri Lanka, uh, I'm using a Nord VPN right now, etc. Um, booked a trip to UK at the same time as London meeting on the September the 6th, but because of complete inability to follow the simplest of instructions, I missed any chance to get tickets, uh, any wait list or additional meetup options. Uh, no idea, my friend. I'm really sorry. Uh, like, it's kind of terrifying to think that you flew all the way to the UK to go to a meetup and then you forgot to book a ticket for the actual venue um but so, uh yeah what i've heard is that the uh the main meetup is already booked out, like out completely all the rsvps are taken but they're, they're we're trying to do a casual meetup after it uh at like a park or something that anyone who missed out can just rock up and and say hi that's my understanding well, so there's an after party basically yeah well, you could do start day. a fire and wait by the exit yeah, I'll set myself on fire. Let's see what happens. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe there'll be something then in that case. Are we going to put out anything to let people know? Or uh, you have to ask Gar Gary that. Um, but okay. I am pretty sure that there is going to be a, like I said, an 
a, a later meetup on a on a day or two after the primary one at a park, a casual thing, and anyone can just rock up. And I play it. I, I I have some swords, so I bring some swords, even some foam lap ones, and you know, we, 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 I'll, we can we can hit people. It'll be fun. I'll bring a trident and just throw it at people. That's my plan. <laughs> Um, also, he said, uh, P.S. Shad, hi from another Australian, obviously not in Australia, and I think NordVPN might be why it said my previous Super Chat was uh, my first one for at least the third time so far this year. <laughs> so, yeah, he's from Australia. Oh, hello he to says, a fellow Aussie. Um, Jordan Pendragon says, howdy, everyone. Shout out from Fort Morgan, uh, CEO, uh, Colorado, I guess. Uh, final, final resting place of Philip K. Dick. <laughs> Dick. All right. Uh, Matt G says, Drinker, I overheard you previously mentioning the movie Pandorum. I rather enjoyed that film. Nice. Uh, pretty cool science fiction. I personally think Ben Foster is a really underrated actor. It would make a good drinker recommends. It might do, actually. It would be good to do a, a revisit of that movie. I remember also, quite enjoying to agree it. That ben Foster is underrated. He turns up in a lot of stuff and always gives a good performance. Yeah. He's in 310 to Yuma, oh. the remake. Oh, yeah. Be good in that. Sure, yeah, yeah. Damn. It's funny, these people that just turn up in random things. Yeah. Um, Blue Collar Loser says, to the panel, going to see Equalizer 3 tonight. Uh, 2 wasn't as good, but it's still fun. 3 is the last movie I feel worth seeing in 2023. Thoughts on 1 and 2? Uh, I, I haven't seen 2. I've seen the first one. Thought I haven't seen any game. of them. I'm a bad man. You are a bad man and a long man. Long bad. What's, what's strange is that all these action stars, the minimum age is like 60. They're not getting any younger. Yeah. Like Denzel <laughs> no. Washington. Then you got but we're not getting extended. new ones. That's the that's the problem. Well, Chris Hemsworth's the closest. I mean, then you got the expendables when everyone's like a pensioner. Yeah. So it's like, it just keep going. Because they've got another um, expendables coming out. You know, maybe, like yeah. this year, this I month. Think? Henry Cavill. Oh, is it could this have month, been... is it? Shit. Yeah. yeah, at the end of it. Okay. Henry Cavill could have been the next big action star if they gave him a proper chance. But... He had like false stuff several times. Yeah, but he's but, white. Well, he's getting a he's getting a <laughs> Highlander movie with um, the guy who did the John Wick films. Is that true? I, I heard rumor. I didn't know if it was correct or not. Apparently, it is. Yeah, That's Highlander. All right, I'm interested. I'll keep my eye out for that. He's gonna have to slim down now because he's huge. So it's like, who's the villain gonna be? Where he just stands <laughs> over them. It just he needs to like lose about fifty pounds in muscle. I don't know. Don't let him stay at that. And the villain should be the guy who's in the Reacher Amazon TV series. He is huge. That guy. Oh yeah. shit! Um, that's yeah. good. That's a good shout. Um, the name has totally like jumped out of my head now. But like uh, I remember like when we saw him in Fast Ten, like he was just like super big at that point. Like he's obviously bulked up even more since Reacher. Um, yeah, I think that that dude could like have a really good future, like he as an could, action star. Yeah, actually, I, I enjoyed just... him in Reacher. He did a good job. Um, Stephen Bobo says, "I hope this question reaches Shad." Well, it will. Right. Uh, which Final Fantasy rule of cool weapons do you like the best? Cloud's Buster Sword or Squall's Gun Blade? Oh, the Buster Sword, absolutely. I would. I'm yeah, just... I was going to say, I'd love to hear you explain how a gun blade works because it makes no sense. Well, actually, I do. There's, a, I have a video on Shadowversity because there's historical precedent. They existed in the past. An actual gun sword. I'm not kidding. They made them. <laughs> they're in. They're in museums. Well, there you go. They like. They they were more of a novelty historically <laughs> because the ultimate result was a less effective gun and a less effective sword. Um, because the, the, the sword actually throws off the balance and it makes it more difficult to aim. And having the gun component as attached to a sword, it made it more fragile and harder to use as a sword. And so oftentimes <laughs> people... Like <laughs> it kind of feels like the gun nullifies the sword as well. It's like, well, I could I could try and engage you in like hand to hand combat, or I could just fucking shoot you from like twenty feet away. Yeah, but fucking you can run out of Jones. bullets. Like this is back in the day when bullets were limited, and especially around when there were muskets, and so you only have one solid shot before you needed to reload. And so in that sense, there was there was some logic about still having a sword on your on your person ready to fight. Um, but ultimately, it, it, people just worked out like, I guess what I can hold a sword. And a gun in two separate hands, and that seems to achieve the purpose as well. If you get the chance, Shad, 
go to the Tower of London because they've got some amazing oh. stuff. Like they've got gun blades on display there, and yeah. I took a picture of one, and it honestly looks like something out of a steampunk anime. <laughs> I'm it's going, man. It's so I'm, I'm fucking cool. Yeah, it's oh, the actual awesome. Royal Armoury is there, so... Yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah, not only I'm going there, I'm also going to be going to the Wallace Collection, which is just some amazing swords. I'm so excited to see that. Nice. You, you'll get to see Henry VIII's suit of armor that he actually wore, which is with that massive, cool. huge cod piece that's just right there. Yeah, in he needed gun. it. Okay. Yeah. There's a there's a huge <laughs> cod piece, and there's a huge like um how can I describe it? Like there was a lot of room for expansion around the midsection <laughs> with his <laughs> armor. Excellent. There's also the crown jewels at the Tower of London as well, so you can see that as well. Uh, are we yeah. still talking Where's about Charles the codpiece or yeah. Um... Yeah. and yeah. the crown jewels? Um, Silk Crayfish says, "I wanted to ask, how are you guys so good at naming characteristics of characters at the top of your heads? I struggle with characters I love, uh, like Vi. Uh, what I mean, are you talking about like when we do reviews of things and we just give them names? I don't know." Uh, well, I was just going to say, it's our job. We're supposed to be good at that. If we weren't, yeah. we'd be out of a job. <laughs> like, we're supposed to be able to tell you quickly uh, why you get endeared to or understand the, the you know the character themselves, or why you don't. In, in the case of a lot of the Ahsoka stuff, we're trying to tell you, like, we can't fucking find characteristics for these people. It's impossible. <laughs> um, I, so, yeah. I tend to remember, like, the characters I love, and, and does, they don't need to be heroes for me to love the characters and everything, and I try and remember some of the core characteristics and the kind of countenance of that of that individual, and then when I'm writing a character, I love to pick from, oh, it'll be really fun to mess with this type of personality trait and then blend it with this one, and uh, it just becomes a joy in then making new characters based on ones that you've enjoyed in the past. Yeah. yeah. Um... It's someone you can train. Mm. Uh, next one is Cassius, who says, we need a Freddie Prince Jr. Force Ghost for the, the memes wearing the Fred Jones ascot. Do it. Um, Master Austin says, hail open bar. Mauer, I just finished your Ant-Man Quantum Mania video. Brilliant work. I'm looking forward to your next projects, especially TFA. Also ordered all three vinyl figurines. Cheers <laughs> to you. Thank you very much. Glad you enjoyed it. And yes, more projects will happen. Nice. Uh, Noah Sprague Studios says, Moller, I just finished watching Andor and I found it very enjoyable. The speech at the final episode was way better than Ant Man's and Barbie. Oh, fuck yeah. I mean, that's a low <laughs> benchmark, but yeah. Yeah. It's never too late to stop being a dick. Uh, Derek says, Ahsoka's ratings are lower than a lightsaber's chance of killing anyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I can't. What is going through their brain to ruin lightsabers? They were such a deadly, intimidating weapon. Like, like, how could they think that stabbing someone through with a lightsaber is like, oh, we'll just let them live? Are you, are you retarded? Well, what, what is going it's through a your cheap mind? Cliffhanger. That's all there is. Oh. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the Thirty Eighth Shadow says, "My animation degree at uni includes a class on copyright law. Just learned that the writers of Predator have filed a reclaim." Uh, sorry, filed to reclaim the script rights from Disney. That would be nice. awesome if they did. Do it. Uh, Derek says, people try to excuse bad writing in Star Wars by saying that it's kids stuff, but the best Star Wars material appealed to mature audiences. Knights of the Old Republic, the Thrawn trilogy of novels, and Andor to name but a few. Yeah. And I don't agree. Has appeal for all ages. There's no reason not to, right? Yeah, exactly. There are some kids media that has phenomenal writing and great character work, and actually has some more mature kind of um, stuff. Like How to Train Your Dragon, the first movie is actually has some really good complex character uh, dynamics in it, and it's a brilliantly written film. Yeah. Um, Confucius says, "For the love of God, send help! I work for CPS, and I'm providing visits for this family." The only thing they've done is watch Marvel and Star Wars, and I can't take it anymore. Ahsoka makes me want to peel my eyes out through my skull. <laughs> I don't blame you, to be fair. Um, it is crap. Cassius. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Cassius Victor says, Hail crew, drinker, I just finished listening to your cameo in Dungeon Crawl Carl, the audiobook series. Solid job, almost like it was written by you. How did you get into playing that character? I don't know. <laughs> I can't even remember now. 
I think they got in touch with me by email and then I went to a local recording studio and then I did it. Um, and I don't know the, the overall story of Dungeon Crawler Carl, but I just had a little bit of fun with that character. So it was, uh, yeah, it was good fun. Um, yeah, it's weird that people people keep referencing it. It's great. I guess it's bigger than I expected it to be. Um, Rune says, I'm just Dave. Tell me to leave and I won't behave. All right, go away now, Dave. Um, Jessica Reloaded says, Critical Drinker, sending Super Chat to get your attention. I sent you an email a week ago to schedule a show. We'd love to have you on. Uh, sorry for being annoying, but also not sorry. I had to get uh, Senpai's attention somehow. Well, I'm doing my best to, um, like, you know, reply to all of these requests. Um, there's only so many that I can do for obvious reasons, um, but I will try and get on as many things as I can. I'm pretty busy over the next few weeks, that's for sure. Um, Intelligent Crayon Eater says, you could tell the writers uh, for Ahsoka have no real world experience. They heard that General is a high rank, but they have no idea of the responsibilities for thousands of people that come with that. A General can't just go adventuring by themselves. That's really true. Yeah, and is she just exempt from wearing a uniform? Like, like she looks like she's just a mercenary. But no, she's a general. She looks like well, look she's at... a fucking bad cosplayer that didn't put much effort in. <laughs> yeah, that is what she looks like. It's a it's a poor effort at cosplay. Depends on our general, because some generals now are like wearing skirts when they're men. So maybe she's one of them. <laughs> yeah. That inspires confidence in our military, doesn't it? Yeah. Reaper. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Just... Uh, Richard Alexander said, uh, Hey Shad, your message to young men video was really inspiring. Perfect timing for my own life. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, man. That means a lot. Uh, it was a bit spontaneous, actually, that video, but uh, uh, a lot of people have appreciated it. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I really, I, I watched it myself, actually, and I thought it was really good. I, just, I watched you it. You tell it really came from the heart. It's important as well. It's, uh, it's getting to be more and more of a problem as time goes on. So. It really is. Uh, and so there's a couple of things that have come up from that video and comments that I also want to talk about. And um, and yeah, you're absolutely right, because I think we need to speak about it a bit more because uh, uh, a lot of young guys are really struggling. Yeah. It's, it's funny, like the, the responses you get to this sort of thing is like, uh, you know, oh, the, the problem is that men are, uh, you know, encouraged to just like keep their feelings to themselves and be tough and stoic and stuff. And I always like my response is like, well, okay, but they've been encouraged to be that way for like hundreds of years now. Why are they suddenly ending themselves in massive numbers? Like, what's changed mm -hmm. in in the past ten years or so? It's not it's not like society's attitudes towards them in that regard. It's there's something else here. The biggest killer of men is suicides. Like in yeah, beats like heart disease and all that. Yeah, but like, why? Why is it suddenly happening in such massive numbers? It's not because, you know, the, they've they've been told in the past like few years, oh, like you, you can't talk about your emotions or you can't uh, you can't um, express yourself. It's always can't even been escape. like that. Because you escape to a soaker and they just go boo, and you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, well, that, that's kind of what I'm hitting at here. It's like, well, okay. If every mm. every cultural outlet tells them that they're a piece of shit and that they're the root of all problems in the world, like, well, what do you expect to fucking happen? You know, that's why everyone's going east, watching Korean yeah. shows and like anime. It's the one thing you can get away from. <laughs> for now, for now. Oh God, yeah, it is. Um, Roger Rubio says, "Enjoy a round of drinks for you guys. Appreciate you all. Thank you very much. Appreciate that." Uh, Marksman. Of 117B says, Have you seen Altiori's Ahsoka review? It's absolutely hilarious. I haven't seen it yet, I don't think. I saw it's pretty good. Um, Patrick Mulligan says, Drinker, why do you not like the 12 Angry Men TV film? Great cast and great updating of the script. I think it's better in some ways over the original. I don't know. I've never I've never expressed an opinion on the, the remake. I don't think I've ever said anything about it. Maybe yeah, it's I'm really good. It. I've, just not seen it yeah I, I would say like you're gonna have to go some to beat the original because i think it was a really good movie very um, true but yeah maybe it's really good like it's kind of like the um the remake they did in the 90s of the night of the living dead 
apparently it's it's quite good. I've only seen little bits of it. Um but again, yeah, I would I would say like, well, the original probably has priority there, um, unless you've really improved on it. Um I'll do a couple more and then finish up. Um Axel's abode says Sabine is noted as being the worst person in terms of the force. Someone not powerful that has to use it in small, clever ways would be great thematically, but the opposite will happen out of nowhere. Yeah, she's yep. just going to become uber powerful because she just yeah, it'll really, be a, really wanted to. It'll be an emotional scene. Someone's threatened, and then she'll do a big feat instead of the more interesting thing I think to do, which would be something big happens. She gets emotional, and she just can't pull off anything bigger than moving a fucking baseball, you know, and that that sucks. Or just you know, someone isn't there some something kind of inherently like awesome and heroic about a person who's like woefully under equipped for the situation but decides to make a stand regardless yeah. like wasn't that one of the few things we commended by um obi-wan where it's like uncle owen decides to make a stand against reva it's like i've got no chance of beating you but like you're not getting past me unless yeah, I'm he dead. does go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her, which is pretty cool yeah which is like yeah it's pretty pretty fucking awesome that's, yeah. that's the human spirit right there overcoming weaknesses and limitations it can be super satisfying and so having a character that has like significant challenges where they're not they just don't suddenly become magically great which is what we it looks like they're going to do with sabine can be really satisfying it reminds me of the arithmetist written by brandon sanderson where the concept of that book was basically someone who goes to magic school and doesn't can't do any of the magic at all. And throughout the entire novel, he never like the whole point. He doesn't get the magic. He'll never get the magic, and he ends up doing something amazing based on these other qualities he has because he has to work through his weaknesses. And it's a brilliantly done story as a result. It's a lot of fun. Which is yeah, that would be a much more interesting character to examine. I think. <laughs> um, Slawa Boga says, was not expecting this. Love epochs on Lotus Eaters. Hey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very uh, Ginger much. Ra Ginger Rhino says, writing a story in a world where casters have to link to a familiar for power. The point of view character cut off from his link becomes a monster hunter and decides to try and claw back what peer that he can. Okay. All right. Um, Sleepy Biden says, uh, good day from one Aussie to another. Ah, good day, mate. Good day. Uh, Marksman says, uh, Australians are just Brits who went down the uh, skill tree instead of the tech tree. <laughs> uh, Sam saying nothing. Um, Gary's beard crab says, the dragon rides again on the winds of time, uh, and I could not care less. Um, DC says, on a scale of 1 to 10, how annoying is it to constantly get TV and movie recommendations? It's not annoying as it's such. Right. It's, it, it's frustrating in the sense that like you just don't have enough time to watch all the stuff. That That's the biggest problem because like people come yeah. to you and they're like, this, this TV show is fucking amazing. Um, it's just going to take like 80 hours of your time and you can watch all, all of, like 10 seasons of it or whatever. It's like, okay, cool. Like, I just, I don't have the time to watch it. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, it can be really good when they put you onto something that's legitimately great. Like, I had no intention to watch Picard season three at all, but it was everyone's recommendations and saying, check it out. It's really good that I did. And man, am I so happy. I, like, Picard season three was, I loved it. It was wonderful. I was none of us recommending it, was it, Shad? <laughs> like, you know, I was just singing its praises, and you're like, nah, I drink is full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, I ended up watching um, Squid Game, Arcane, and Andor through people continuously recommending them. So, yeah, you know. it does happen. I think it's it, for me, it's a lot easier if someone recommends a film. It's like, okay, that's like two hours. Like, I can get through that. Like, if it's a TV show with multiple seasons, like, well, okay, that's a much bigger commitment of time, and it's harder to do. And you have to be a bit more, you know, judicious yeah. about what you actually commit yourself yourself to. Well, uh, you're right about the time because One Piece has come out. I've got to watch eight hours of that. Then I've got to watch <sighs> the Wheel of Time tomorrow. Then there's Equalizer <laughs> three, all in like three days. Yeah. Uh, so I tried to start One Piece. I haven't gotten far into it. I'm not like only like ten minutes into the first episode. Wheel of Time is my priority though. That's dropping tomorrow and. Uh, I'll be reviewing the first season it. was just atrocious. 
Oh, it was dog crap. It was a, a travesty, a massive disappointment. And so You're a book I have, fan, aren't you? I'm a massive book fan. I freaking love it. See, I book. wasn't, and I still, I just went, I don't know what's going on. They've established <laughs> nothing. Oh, the, the insult is so much worse when you know the books. Like what they did is, is criminal to the books. And it was all for the progressive woke agenda. It's so yeah, frustrating. I was, I saw your uh, reviews. They were great. Like, cause you were like, you were trying to be like really nice at first. You go, oh, maybe, maybe oh, they've was... got a good thing going. Maybe they've, and then well, was it episode four or five? You just went, it's done. It's ruined. Yeah, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, I, I, just died. that was the series that kind of red pilled. Like I get, I went into it giving every benefit of the doubt. I was just like, all right, I see the warning signs. I'm going to give it a chance. I was going in, going into it such good faith. And they stabbed me in the back so vilely. Episode five was the one that just made me flip out. I couldn't, st- I couldn't believe what they did. Have I you seen the poster. Rand, yeah, the main yeah. character, I know, the guy called the Dragon, is at the back. <laughs> Everyone uh, else it, in front of him. But that's what they did the whole season. Like, like guys, the Wheel of Time, especially the first book. The, the it's about the th- these three got main characters right and there are three female characters that also play very prominent roles but you know the main characters are these three guys right they become jokes in this in the show like they become background side characters and what they did to them was criminal i can't stand it and season two now season two baby Mm. yeah uh, well, I, I'm we're probably going to finish it up there because uh, I know we've done uh, about three hours of this stream right now. Um, we've still got a bunch of like super chats that we need to get through, but I'll do that uh, on a catch up stream. Uh, but I want to say thank you to you gentlemen that have joined us tonight for this uh, for this um, open bar. Uh, it's been much appreciated. Uh, Reaper, History Bro, Shad, it's been great to have all of you guys on tonight. Um, and I guess like if there's anything you guys want to like make us aware of that you've got coming up, um, like by all means tell us now. This is a good opportunity. Go for it. Well, do I mean, it. Wheel of Time reviews. I'll be watching that and then review it. Like I'll be filming the review right after I watch it, and that's all. And I have tomorrow. Tomorrow is set aside. We like I've scheduled nothing on tomorrow apart from Wheel of Time and then FNT in the evening. And I don't know how much. Yeah, Gary will let me rant about it on FNT, but I'll hopefully get out of my system. But that's so, and then I'll hopefully have that, that uploaded and published by tomorrow evening. So look out on look out for that on Night's Watch. It's coming. All right, nice. Um, I've yeah, also like... got. Oh, sorry. sorry you go. I was going to say, uh, I've also got the Wheel of Time review, but I've also got to watch forty-four episodes of the One Piece anime. Then the eight hour episodes <laughs> to compare the differences. <laughs> so, I mean, they're just on and it just keeps going. So I've got all that, and I'm just going to see it as itself and as an adaptation. So I'm just going to see which one's the difference. So I'll be busy. Um, I'll like, just yeah. say if anyone uh, would consider um, subscribing at the Lotus Eaters website, I do a weekly history cast, I suppose you could say. It's usually a couple, at least a couple of hours long. Um, and there's my little channel, History Bro, with a few hundred hours worth of content on there. So maybe head over there if you're interested in straight up history stuff. Uh, one talk with you, Drinker, actually, that lasted quite a, about three hours or so, all about. <laughs> yeah, we can't. So if anyone's a big one. Drinker fan, go and check that out. Yeah, yeah I did all as well uh, with you. When... So that could be the starting point, right? Yeah. I think it was, it was the ones we did with you on History Bro or Lotus Eaters. It was on Lotus Eaters. And there's also um, a conversation with Mauler all about um, what, did, what did we do? Inglorious uh, Bastards. Bastards, yeah. Yeah. Oh, one thing I'd like to say if any of you four guys ever want to come on Lotus Eaters or History Bro, just drop me a line. And of course, I'll have you well, on in I, split seconds. I, I think when uh, Napoleon comes out, I'd like to talk with you about that. Yes, oh, please. Yes, please. <laughs> also, good. my vinyl figures are still out there for another however many days. I have my video, <laughs> in, in case anyone doesn't know, my yearly video came out. <laughs> Mollo's <laughs> annual review of stuff uh, comes out. Uh, so, mm-hmm. yeah, he's got his Quantum Mania video that's out right now. Uh, and 
there's still time for you to order a vinyl Mauler figurine. So um, the link is in the description. If you haven't ordered one already and you're interested in doing it, because why wouldn't you be? It's a chance yeah. to get Mauler immortalized in vinyl. Um, yeah, do it now. Uh, it's there in the description. So yeah, give it a go. And the link to everyone's channels who are on this stream tonight, again, they're in the description. So if you haven't followed them already, I do strongly recommend that you do because they all produce amazing content. Cheers, um, Cheers. But Sash. yeah, uh, for, for all you guys that have joined us tonight, thank you very much. And uh, like I say, if we've missed your Super Chats tonight, we will get to them on the catch-up stream on Sunday. But for all of us tonight, that is all we've got for today. So go away now. See you.